Once you are awake, it is almost impossible to fall back to sleep again. Once you discover that the Earth is not a spinning globe, but a flat and stationary plane with a firmament above it, everything changes. The trusted voices and satanic scientific priests who once shaped our reality and understanding of the world are no longer reliable. Our first-hand experience of the Earth as a stationary realm is at odds with their fabricated narrative of space and spinning planets. The scarring of our land and the barbaric mining of Earth's once majestic giant trees is at odds with the history books and geological narrative. And the Awake are left wondering, what on Earth happened? If they've lied about the Earth, space, and the destruction of our flat realm, then how can we trust the official, mainstream historical narrative? The historical narrative, like the heliocentric model, does not make sense. It doesn't add up. And all it takes is a closer examination, and their lies, which have governed our understanding of history and the world since our birth, begin to fall apart. Let's stir the mind with a few contemplations. We are told that the first true power tool was invented in 1895, when a German company combined an electric motor with a manual drill. The drill weighed 16 and a half pounds and required multiple operators. It wasn't until 1957 that a company called Bosch began designing power tools in bulk that were both economical and powerful. So then how did our historical ancestors a more primitive, underdeveloped people design and build some of the structures we encounter. What about all the gigantic monolithic stones we encounter that have been cut with such precision? Ask yourself, could you repeat this today with the arsenal of equipment we have at our disposal? And what about the magnificent ancient step wells of the East? Step wells, we are told, were multi-storied wells built by our primitive ancestors as ways to preserve the water supply during droughts. But look at the intricacy and complexity of these structures. Look at the glory and the finesse. Look at the geometric precision. All dug out and crafted from using hand tools. Yeah, right. What about the gigantic canal networks we find all over the world? The Erie Canal in America was allegedly built between 1817 and 1825. There were no civil engineers in America at this time. The people responsible for planning construction were novices, we are told. The canal is 12 meters wide and 4 meters deep. The Erie Canal spans 363 miles. But this was not just a case of digging each day for the Irish immigrants and their oxen companions. They had to fell hundreds of trees as they passed through the virgin forest. They had to build complicated aqueducts and locks, and they had to pass through the Niagara Escarpment, an 80-foot high wall of hard limestone. They had to use black powder to blast through this, we are told, as dynamite had yet to be invented. The canal spans 363 miles and was constructed over an eight-year period. This means that on average, one mile was completed every eight days. What a record, especially since those responsible were novices and power tools and dynamite were yet to be invented. I can tell you now, the so-called early settlers of the Americas did not build these canal systems. And what of the grand and magnificent castles scattered across our realm? Did you know that most were designed and constructed without plumbing systems and methods to heat rooms properly. Hmm. The royal and the elites of the past were content without having the accessible necessities of survival just as long as they could live within the grand and the glorious. While the peasants, in their modest abodes, enjoyed warmth throughout the long dark winters? I don't think so. And of course, there is the impossibility of the Great Giza Pyramid Complex. The pyramids, we are told, were constructed somewhere around 2500 BC. 
The Great Pyramid itself consists of 2.3 million blocks of limestone and granite, and its overall structure weighs 6 million tons. The largest granite stones weigh between 20 and 80 tons each. 20 tons is 20,000 kilograms. These blocks were carved from quarries with copper chisels and allegedly transported from 800 kilometers away. The so-called experts can only theorize that a vast amount of slave labor was required. Being gullible and falling for the official narrative of slave labor is one thing, but can someone please explain how the air shafts of the Great Pyramid align so neatly with the circumpolar stars? And then there is the curious case of star forts, or what the official liars of the world call bastion forts. Developed in the late 15th and early 16th century, these forts, we are told, were designed during an era of gunpowder and the cannon. The geometric design offered a nation's military protection against blind spots during conflict. Of course they did. We all know that the best protection during war is to design a fort with such precise geometric patterning. Has any real historian ever stopped to think just how perfect the geometry is here? Our primitive ancestors did not have the technology to view structures from above, but they still managed to achieve this. Give me strength. There is no way. We could not produce such perfect geometry on this scale today. We've been fooled once again. We have been indoctrinated with a false historical narrative and timeline. And, like the silly heliocentric model, all it takes is a closer look at this narrative and things soon start to fall apart and the lies become so blatantly evident. Because of their satanic lies, piecing together an accurate, honest historical timeline has become an impossible Rubik's Cube. The official narrative, a Pandora's box, only offering us tiny clues, half-truths and deceptions. The stitchings of our true historical timeline have been loosened. The contents are raised and muddled before we were even born into this world. And herein lies the problem. How to know where you are going if you don't know where you are in the first place. But you see, awakening is truly a gift. Once awake, we learn that we've always had the answers right in front of us. We've always had more than we know. But we had to regain our sight first before things started falling into place. Before things started to make a little more sense. And here we are again, viewer at the precipice of another great journey. What if I told you that before us there existed a civilization that was responsible for the most advanced technology ever developed, and that it was their understanding of the workings of our flat realm that was key to their innovation? And what if I told you that it is highly likely that our true history as a people only begun just over 200 years ago? Would you think of me as mad once again? Do I sound as preposterous as when I first told you that the earth is flat? Perhaps, and that's why I need to show you. What I hope to show you is one of the greatest cover-ups of all time. It is on par with the heliocentric lie in its enormity and the impact it has upon humanity. And, as I will try to show you, it is inextricable from the true nature of our flat realm earth and you cannot understand one without understanding the other. We cannot waste time, for we must journey in search of lost time. At its heart, this is a story about deception. It is also a story of endings and beginnings, of death and rebirth. And please bear with me. Due to the deceptions and falsities underpinning our historical narrative, this story cannot be told in a linear fashion. We need to go back and forth in time to really draw out something that brings us a little closer to the truth. It is also imperative to understand that like much contemporary science, history as a discipline was corrupted a long time ago. 
At its most innocent, a lot of established historical narrative is guesswork. But at its worst, it is a set of lies agreed upon, as the so-called Napoleon put it so succinctly. We are going to be digging in the dark. No historian will be there to help us. We are alone in this journey. Our journey is a hunt for things buried in plain sight. And things may become a little uncomfortable at times, but it is necessary. We have been living a comfortable lie for far too long now. Come on, jump in and put your seatbelt on. For to understand our place in the world, we need to do the unthinkable. It's time for us to take a journey back to the future. Our journey begins in the unlikeliest of places, 19th century St. Petersburg, at the entrance to St. Isaac's Cathedral. The city cold, the early morning mists dissipating with the approach of the sun, and our boots caked in mud. The year is 1860, and while St. Petersburg stands regal and proud, its inhabitants are nowhere to be found. It is quiet, too quiet. The population of St. Petersburg in the 1860s was, we are told, roughly 500,000 people. And yet there is not a soul in sight. Where is everybody? The long shadow of Alexander Column gives us a clue as to the time of the sun's journey above this region. Long shadows only occur during morning or evening. It must be morning, but it appears that no one has surfaced yet. If we travel 400 miles across to Moscow, we see the same thing. Empty, quiet streets. In 1860, Moscow shared a similar population with St. Petersburg, roughly 500,000 citizens. But again, where is everybody? What about the rest of the world during this time period? Edinburgh, Scotland, 1840s. Copenhagen, Denmark, 1840s. Dresden, Germany, 1860s. Rio in Brazil, 1860s. Toronto, Canada, 1860s. Athens in Greece, 1860s. And then London, finally, people. What about Paris? People, life. The first photograph, we are told, was created in 1822. The art of photography relies on methods of juxtaposition, of comparison and contrast to deliver its message and sentiment. In these old photographs, we do not find the same deliberate techniques of juxtaposition that contemporary photographers craft into their art, but rather we find natural contrasts that are so important and central to navigating through our deceptive history. Contrast is a phenomenon, natural or artificial, in which meaning is generated and conveyed through the comparison of two opposing elements. When looking at 1860s Russia, 
there is an immediate contrast between the lack of population and the sheer size of these cities. Even in the 19th century, both Moscow and St. Petersburg are enormous. The infrastructure found in the photographs could hold a population well into the millions. Why are the cities so vast if the population was only 500,000 in each? Furthermore, the official narrative gives us a population that increases in a linear fashion from 1764. Many of the buildings we see here were built years before the photograph was taken. Did the Russians just plan well in advance? But it's when the population is introduced into these photographs that a new contrast emerges that is staggering. That is, between the people and the environment itself. It may be the reduced population numbers, or it may be the monochromatic starkness of the black and white images, but they present to us something that we've lived amongst our entire lives and never paid any mind to. That is, the enormity and impossibility of the architecture. As we engage with the industry and act of tourism, we journey from place to place and observe, taking it all in, learning, hearing, and being told what we are looking at and how it came to be. And standing in front of a structure like the Arc de Triomphe in Paris, we might even exclaim, wow, how did they do this? But the moment, inextricably wrapped up in the busyness of the scene, perhaps prevents us from really asking that question with sincerity. Standing in front of a structure like the Arc de Triomphe while the crowd frantically takes pictures on their smartphones makes it all a reality. And we conclude, before being shoved away by new tourists, well, they had to have done it somehow because I'm here and looking at it. During our indoctrination at school, we are seldom shown old photographs of the grand cities scattered around our flat realm. And perhaps for good reason. Because when we marinate on images like this, and are presented with the visual evidence of a very primitive Victorian people, dotted around like grasshoppers within the shadows of the most magnificent, grandiose, brilliant architecture a human could ever imagine we begin to have doubts. Indeed, how did they build this? The Arc de Triomphe is made from 36,695 cube meters of limestone and weighs 95,407 tons or just over 95 million kilograms. They tell us it took 12 years to build the giant arch in two different periods, between 1806 to 1814 and between 1832 to 1836. How did they transport this amount of limestone with the same horse and carts that we see in the photographs? Look closer at the four sculptures that adorn each of its sides. Look at the intricacy of the sculptures and the patterning of the ornamentation that frames the arch. Each section is perfectly repeated without any deviation or inconsistency. The first true power tool was not invented until 60 years after this arch was completed. They tell us this was crafted by hand. Is that even possible? And then there is the ceiling of the arch. Immaculate. 3D sculpted roses, perfect in their geometric symmetry. The nuance of the detail and finesse of each petal and cross-section borders is overwhelming. Look at the rest of Paris during this time. Again, a plethora of unbelievable, gigantic and magnificent structures. The city's infrastructure glorious, and the people and their means of transport primitive, unsophisticated, and seeming not at all developed to the point of producing a city like this. The roads are improperly paved and uneven. They are dirty and muddy. We also see buildings during this period in which the architecture aligns with the inhabitants. 
buildings of misshapen proportions, less developed and refined, charming in their own way, but coarse in their use of wood and plaster. This is exactly the type of architecture we expect of a generation of horse and cart, a generation ignorant to the discoveries in technology that would follow in the years to come. Furthermore, at the time of this photograph, the arch is roughly 40 years old since its completion. Yet can you see how worn some of the parts of the structure are? We see weathering on the stone that suggests the arch is much older. As we approach the late 19th century, we see that the people of Moscow have finally decided to leave their homes and venture out into the streets. The infamous Red Square, now bustling with life. St. Basil's Cathedral and the Spaskaya Tower dominate the frame of the square. The construction of St. Basil's Cathedral began in 1555 and was completed in 1561, a mere six years. It suffered a huge fire in 1737 and underwent restoration over a 20-year period. But look at it. What a structure. Almost unreal and like no other. It is composed of thousands of red bricks and tin sheet metal that has been shaped into the distinctive onion domes we see. Look closer at the intricacy of the domes. How did they bend metal to achieve such precision and perfection in the 18th century? And again, if they had the skills and dedication to build a wonder such as this, then why are the conditions of the road so poor and covered in mud? We see these incredible structures and buildings everywhere in 19th century photography. We have the wondrous Crystal Palace of London, a monstrous structure with the greatest area of glass ever seen in a building and all constructed before England had automatic glass manufacturing. We have Westminster Abbey and Parliament. We have the old Euston Arch, constructed out of pure sandstone in 1837, and streets unpaved and full of mud. Why did these people not prioritize the streets they walked upon? The Frauenkirche, the domed masterpiece of Dresden, Germany. Its intricate and opulent splendor in direct contrast with the beat-up wagons and horse-pulled carts of the people below. A people dependent on the bare necessities. A people completely dwarfed by its size and majesty. The Library of Parliament in Ottawa, Canada. Built over a period of 17 years. The first major settlers arrived in 1800 and at the time of construction, the city's population was under 20,000. Would a grand, glorious library really be a priority for settlers? Why does the building look like it's been cropped out of Europe and pasted into Canada? Even at the turn of the century, 40 years before Bosch economized the power tool, we have the old Penn Station in New York. Look at the size of this. Completely mind-blowing proportions. As we can see here in the photograph, each octagonal sculpted pattern on the arched dome ceiling is larger than one individual human. Look at the gigantic columns and detailed asanthus sleeves decorating the tops of each pillar. They tell us this station took six years to build. Six whole years. Yeah, right. Why are we so gullible? Even with our access to modern power tools, printable construction pieces, and crane technology, we could not reproduce this today. And more importantly, we don't reproduce this type of architecture today. The official liars of our world have an umbrella term for this type of architecture that we see in North America. They call it historism. Historism is a term coined to describe a style of architecture that is revival in nature, or in other words, copies the style of another period in time. 
The grand arches and buildings with giant columns we see are built in the classical or Greco-Roman style and the cathedrals are built in the Renaissance and Gothic styles of medieval Europe. Components of these particular styles of architecture feature large spires, arched windows, towers, turrets, domes, arcaded arches, sculptures, enormous doors, circular geometric windows, columns, clock faces and bell towers. Traces of this impossible architecture are literally found everywhere, in every city and across our world today. Some preserved and maintained, like the Parisian Arc de Triomphe and Notre Dame, and others lost and long forgotten to time, like the Euston Arch and the old Penn Station in New York. We as a people travel miles to take our own photographs of these wonders. But the photographers of the 19th century gift us with something. Something they would never have expected to give a future generation. Perspective. We see a primitive people against a backdrop of clearly advanced architectural infrastructure. The official historians of the world tell us tales of Darwinian evolution and progression between time periods. The people that came after were always more advanced in their ways, refining and redefining the methods of the generation that came before. If the height of innovation and industry during the 19th century was still the horse and car as a means of travel, then, as these photographs tell us, this style of architecture was just as impossible for those living in the centuries before it. Anyone with a predisposition for thinking and questioning can immediately sense when looking at these photographs that something is rotten in Denmark, that something is off with the mainstream historical narrative, that something is not adding up. In a panoramic image of San Francisco in 1877, we see a collage of historicist architecture. We see columns adorning the entrances to very regal buildings that stand out like sore thumbs from some of the timber shacks surrounding it. We see Gothic spires and towers in the distance. We see domed cathedrals and buildings. We also see just how sprawling and huge the city has become. In 1846, there were under 500 Mormon settlers living on the area of land in which we now call San Francisco. It was frontier land and ready for the taking. Between 1848 and 1849, with the start of the California Gold Rush, the population increased from 1,000 people to 25,000 people. 28 years later, this panorama was taken. The population at this time, we are told, was getting close to 200,000. Who in their right mind would believe this story? Does this look like a city of 200,000 people? Without any modern technology, power tools, automatic manufacturing, electric motors, a people in a strange, unfounded land just making their mark? Do we really believe that a burgeoning people built this entire city in just 30 years? And again, such quietness, such stillness. This is a photograph of an empty city. Where are all the people? The shadow of the post here tells us that it is not the early hours of the morning. Short shadows only appear toward midday. A city of this scale at noon should be bustling with life. But there is not a single person in the shot of this panorama. The only life we see is that of a horse without any master in sight. It seems highly unlikely that all the people were told to stay indoors because a cityscape photo shoot was taking place. And this silent scene becomes all the more eerie when we consider that there is intention behind the lens. Someone was there standing at a vantage point and taking this photograph. But who and for what?
And what are the chances that in the 19th century, during similar decades, we see deserted Russian, European, and North American cities photographed like this? And then only a few years later, we find the same locations bustling with people, a people clearly incapable of building the architecture found in these cities. And what to do with these photographs? If we accept the narrative and these strange anomalies, then we stop here and get back to our busy lives. But the narrative we've received is not the truth. And we shouldn't accept any narrative, no matter how official and certified it is, unless it makes sense. The people we see in these photographs and their early ancestors could not have built the magnificent architecture we see. It is an impossibility. Come on, jump in. We must venture further into these cities and look a little closer. There must be some clues waiting to be uncovered that helps us understand why these cities are empty. Wait, what's that you say? You want to wipe the mud from your boots first? Do not bother, it's a waste of time. Come on, jump in and let's go. For it is the mud that offers us some small clues as to what could have occurred during this time period. In June 2011, Christchurch, New Zealand suffered an earthquake that left a lot of the city in chaos. Destroying buildings and infrastructure and leaving over 50,000 homes without power. As a result, there were collapsed houses, ruptured water mains, flooding, and fires due to disrupted electrical lines. Due to the strong ground motions and intense shaking, part of the city experienced a strange phenomenon known as soil liquefaction. Sand boils emerged from asphalt roads, toppling and sinking cars, and causing boulders to fall from hills resulting in more home damage. Soil liquefaction occurs when saturated soil loses its strength and stiffness in response to an applied stress, such as shaking or other sudden changes, such as a strong explosion. Loose, saturated soil or sand has a tendency to compress when a load is applied, but in the event of a stress, such as shaking or an explosion, we see the opposite. The soil tends to dilute, and the result is treacherous quicksand or quick clay. The land turns to liquid, causing structures of heavy mass, such as buildings, infrastructure, and cars to start sinking, topple over, or collapse. It can also affect dams and bridges. Turbidity currents can also form huge landslides that are impossible to stop. In the worst case scenario, entire cities may be destroyed. As you can see, liquefaction can move entire areas of land. The mud can rise dramatically and rapidly, and its destructive force is unstoppable. It is a well-documented phenomenon. The 1964 earthquake in Nagata, Japan calls liquefaction, and we can see the effects very clearly in these photos. The same here with the 1964 Alaska earthquake. Buildings toppling, cars sinking, infrastructure collapsing. Once the stress has subsided, the soil begins to solidify once again, and we can see the aftermath. Uneven muddy streets remain where there was once road paving. Returning to photographs of 19th century cities, we see a similar situation here. The roads are unrefined and full of mud. We see unsophisticated, uneven, coarse and muddy roads everywhere against a backdrop of refined, sophisticated and magnificent architecture. Could these cities have suffered the similar fate of soil liquefaction that we see in more recent times? Perhaps. But unfortunately, muddy roads is not enough evidence to base any conclusions on, is it? Children are the most vital of questions. And adults, in their foggy stupor, 
usually provide the most unsatisfactory answers, often regurgitating learned nonsensical information that leave the child's imagination unfulfilled. Squelching along these muddy 19th century roads, observing their surroundings, a child may ask, why did they build the windows so low to the ground? And what an excellent question. Yes, why indeed did they build windows on ground level? For you see, the people we see in these photographs, sadly, did not build this architecture. And maybe some of them, at some point in their busy day-to-day -day life, ask the exact same question. We see it everywhere. Windows at ground level. Windows partially below ground level. First floor entrances raised from the ground level. Steps leading down to entrances below ground level. We can find this in almost every major city across our realm. In both old photographs and when we walk in the streets today. And what does it tell us? That a society with access to modest construction tools and horse and car constructed their infrastructure by first spending countless amounts of hours and energy clearing land with a depth of over three meters to begin their construction? Building basement floors is incredibly hard work. Since the 20th century, large powered excavation machines, such as backhoes and front end loaders, have reduced the time and manpower needed to dig a basement dramatically as compared to digging by hand with a spade. Perhaps you could say that our historical ancestors were just that dedicated to the architecture they built. And you could say that many of the sunken buildings we see are actually due to elevations and depressions in the natural landscape. The official narrative, which is always full of inconsistencies, perhaps would suffice if it was not for contemporary excavation. When we look at photographs such as this, it immediately dawns upon us that what we are seeing are windows and doors two to three meters below the ground surface. Why are there windows and doors underground? What is this that we see in our cities? Natural soil accumulation over time? Geologists have never been able to ascribe a consistent value to worldwide natural topsoil accumulation because it is impossible. Some regions of our realm experience consistent topsoil accumulation, whereas other regions actually experience consistent erosion. Many historians and archaeologists have noted that many cities over the centuries have been destroyed through war and natural phenomena such as earthquakes, volcanic ash, and flooding. Aren't these just the layers of previous civilizations? No. They are not. We see over and over again whole floors of buildings consistent with the architecture existing above the layer of ground.
You see, what lies beneath is not the unfamiliar traces of previous generations, but of the same generation that built these structures. And once you really see this kind of sunken, buried infrastructure that exists in such prevalence across our world, you can never unsee it. We see that the foundations of old churches are actually the original first floors with consistent entrances and windows. We see mosaics unearthed. We see pillars, columns and arches that were originally much larger, and it was the layer of soil that reduced their size, as if they weren't big enough to begin with. And like with the 1964 earthquake in Nagata, Japan, we also find many so-called ancient structures that are leaning. As if at some point, the soil beneath these structures loosened and liquefied. We have the Sahurzen Church Tower and our dear lady at the Mountain Church Tower in Germany. The Tiger Hill Pagoda in China. The Lenin Tower of Nevayansk in Russia. The Lenin Temple of Huma in India. Udkirk in the Netherlands. The Tower of Zaragoza in Spain. And, of course, the Tower of Pisa. The official liars of the world try to justify the buried and tilting structures we see, filling our heads with stories of antiquity and ever-changing geology, but it becomes trickier for them when we turn our attention to America. If we are to believe their narrative, then all of the buildings we see in 19th century photographs of the burgeoning American cities are newly constructed. Why do we see famous structures, such as the Washington Capitol building, with consistent infrastructure that buries very deep into the ground? And again, the inconsistencies do not add up. Why would an underdeveloped people waste resources, energy and time constructing the foundations of the Capitol building to be consistent with the column style we find above the surface? The foundations did not have to feature columns. Columns, we are told, are a stylistic choice, not a functional one. So why would they do this? In a nutshell, they wouldn't. We see images that suggest that the people of the 19th century were actually concerned with moving a lot of the vast amount of mud we see leveling the ground and excavating existing structures. The consistency and prevalence of buried architecture across our realm indicate that whatever happened was a worldwide event, despite regional differences in natural topsoil accumulation and erosion. And there is no official narrative explanation that justifies the buried architecture we see. No explanation provided to justify the amount of mud we see in 19th century photographs of our cities. On the roads, Mud piles from clearing, the roads uneven, the land ravaged, but the architecture grand, perfect and intact. 
applauded by literary scholars for his use of fog as an opening simile and metaphor to paint a portrait of London as a corrupted hub amidst burgeoning industrialization. Many often overlook that Charles Dickens's 1852 novel Bleak House actually opens with a different image. London, Michaelmas term lately over, and the Lord Chancellor sitting in Lincoln's Inn Hall. Implacable November weather, as much mud in the streets as if the waters have but newly retired from the face of the earth. Liquefaction caused havoc across Christchurch and the Garter. But these were isolated earthquake events, and only portions of each city were affected. It is not possible for there to have been huge, simultaneous earthquakes around the world during a similar period. Or is it? Even Wikipedia tells us that liquefaction can occur naturally or artificially, from an earthquake or other sudden change in stress condition. Even if this was the case, we do not see the same structural damage to the buildings in the 19th century like we do in cases such as Christchurch and the Garter. Most of the buried architecture we see is intact. It is either sunken or the ground level has been raised at least three meters, sometimes in a uniform manner and other times partially buried in rolling mud hills as if there were huge landslides. The strange case of the buried architecture provides the following conclusions. That what lies beneath are not the remains of previous civilizations. More often than not, the buried structures are consistent with the architecture we see above ground. That the structures are much larger than originally suspected. And therefore they are even more of a construction impossibility for a Victorian generation of horse and car and those existing before them. That natural topsoil accumulation and soil liquefaction are not satisfactory explanations for what we see here. Whatever took place had to be something much larger and widespread, such as a natural or artificial earthly cataclysm of sorts. As many of the photographs show, many citizens of the 1800s were responsible for moving much of the mud, leveling the ground and excavating buildings, which suggests that whatever happened had happened very recently in their past. The complete absence of a reasonable mainstream justification for the buried architecture we see suggests that the controllers of our realm are deliberately trying to hide whatever happened. And what of the deserted cities we see in the earlier photographs? If these cities were truly empty, then we must ask why. We must also ask how all the people got there in the end. In the space of 30 or so years, we see a city go from barren to bustling. Interestingly, it is Charles Dickens and 19th century literature more generally that offer some clues. Two central themes run throughout 19th century Victorian literature. That of marriage and female chastity and that of orphans and adoption. Many of the fictional characters we've come to love over the years are orphans. We have Oliver Twist and Pip from Great Expectations. We have little orphan Jane Eyre and Heathcliff from Wuthering Heights. We have Mowgli from The Jungle Book, Cosette from Les Miserables. We have Heidi, Rapunzel, Peter Pan, Snow White. We have Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn and Anne of Green Gables. And these books were of their time, as far as orphan prevalence goes. The only issue is that these novels romanticize the orphan as a figure, dislocated from society by default, and therefore pave their life's path as one of unforeseen opportunity. This was not reality. The theme of marriage and chastity that we find in so many 19th century literary works, such as those by Jane Austen, the Brontes, George Eliot, Dickens, Thomas Hardy, Leo Tolstoy, Victor Hugo, and more, was nothing more than carefully disguised, well-written propaganda. 
with their sole purpose to solidify and justify a social value framework that would separate children from their mothers. Children born outside of marriage or wedlock were regarded as illegitimate, meaning they did not have a legal status. Illegitimate children was a serious stigma throughout the 19th century. The majority of employers would not hire women with an illegitimate child. Many unwed mothers with illegitimate children ended up without a home, in poor health, starving, exhausted. Their only place of refuge would be the workhouse, where they would carry out the most unpleasant duties. In some places, women with illegitimate children were singled out and had to wear a special uniform, which alerted everyone to their status as an unmarried mother or fallen woman. As a result, a vast amount of orphanages and foundling institutions were established. This is the London Foundling Hospital that was very active in the 19th century. Look at the size of it. Charles Dickens was obsessed with this place. Inspiration, they say. The official narrative tells us that an estimated 4,500 women handed over their children to this huge building. But this was just one institution. Wikipedia gives us a partial list of over 64 orphanages that were founded in the UK during the 19th century. The list is only partial. The peculiar case of the vast amount of parentless children in the 19th century is well documented by many researchers. And most of them agree it is almost impossible to establish figures that really do justice to just how many orphans there were during this period. Their footprint did not enter the record books. It formed in the mud and was then washed away. It wasn't just the UK. This was a worldwide phenomenon. New York City had four foundling asylums alone that processed thousands of children annually. By the beginning of the 20th century, Italy was reporting 32,000 children per year. Spain and Portugal were reporting 15,000 annual foundlings. Before 1860, 374,000 recorded infants were processed by the asylums in Milan, Naples and Florence alone. Historian David L. Ransell states that Moscow was receiving between 16 and 18,000 infants annually by the 1880s and sending over 10,000 of these each year to outlying villages for care. In 1882, there were all told 41,720 foundlings from the Moscow home living with 32,000 foster families scattered throughout 4,418 villages. A dozen villages had over 90 fosterings each. One thing that is often overlooked is that there were a series of laws passed in the 1800s, making it almost impossible for unwed mothers to keep their babies. The 1833 Poor Law Reformation introduced bastardy clauses that shifted the entire responsibility for the illegitimate child onto the mother. Social stigma meant that she would not be able to provide care for her child and would be forced to hand them over to the authorities, or worse. Advertisements for adoption or nurse care became popular in newspapers. And, as many scholars have pointed out, these were a front for what was termed baby farmers, or paid murder. As Dorothy L. Hallas states, The adverts may have been misleading to the general public, but read like a coded message to unwed mothers. No references are asked for, and none are offered. The sum of 15 shillings a week to keep an infant or a sickly child was inadequate, and a sickly child and an infant under two months were the least likely to survive, and the cheapest to bury. Infants were taken, no questions asked, and it was understood that for £12 no questions were expected to be asked. The transaction between the mother and the baby farmer usually took place in a public place, on public transportation, or through a second party. 
No personal information was exchanged. The money was paid, and the transaction was complete. The mother knew she would never see her infant alive again. Most children, however, were not murdered, but were dropped off at the doorsteps of orphanages or the workhouse. All children taken into these institutions were given entirely new identities. They were provided for with shelter, food, and clothing temporarily, and then sent off to workhouses or another location. Photographs in the 19th century were scarce, but towards the end of the century, we see more photographs, and the last continent to experience such mass exodus of orphans was the United States. And it is here that we see evidence of the orphan trains. The first group of these orphans arrived in Michigan in 1854, and from that moment on, the movement shipped hundreds of thousands of children across the states until it ended in 1929. Officially, there were over 97 institutions involved in orphans and orphan trains in the 19th century. And again, this was not just the United States. Annie McPherson will go down in history as a woman who scammed more than 100,000 foundlings and shipped them from the United Kingdom to Canada, New Zealand and South Africa and even to the outer edges of the earth in Australia so that they could be sold into child labor. Why do we see so many photographs of orphans in workhouses? Why are they working with machinery created for adult use? Were there not enough adults during this time to carry out this work? And then there is a strange case of the burgeoning American amusement parks at the turn of the 20th century. In addition to rides and exhibits, many of these parks featured an unusual attraction, infantoriums. Visitors of these parks could stroll around with ice cream and swing by these stations, a visit equivalent to that of a fully functional neonatal intensive care unit, complete with incubators filled with sleeping, premature babies. History has been kind to Martin Cooney. Touted as a hero, Cooney was the German mind behind the incubators. His first encounter with premature babies, we are told, was at the 1896 World's Fair. He knew immediately that the exhibition would save babies' lives. The technology to keep premature babies alive was expensive, and he knew the public would pay to see the babies in incubators. He would charge an entrance fee at the amusement parks to generate funds to help these babies live. Nurses tended to the babies as an enraptured public looked on. Like any other amusement, the premature baby exhibits included carnival barkers who tried to lure the public to come and see the babies. I don't know about you, but I find something very off about these incubators. Advertisers featuring living babies. A lot of the fairs where Cooney showed his babies also featured eugenics exhibitions. Eugenics is a field of corrupted pseudoscience that endorses selective breeding to improve the genetic quality of the human population. Eugenics was inspired by Darwinism and was a driving ideology that fueled the Nazis. Why are people paying to see living babies? as if they had never seen a living infant before. Did people of the time not have their own babies? And where are these infants' parents? How did they have the technology in the 19th century to keep premature babies alive in such a way? Or is something off, once again, with the official narrative? There were 80,000 premature babies who were treated in these amusement park incubators. 80,000. The hundreds of thousands of orphans in the 19th century are just barely believable. Were women really that carefree? Did America even have the population numbers to justify 80,000 premature babies? We are not talking orphans here, but infants born prematurely. The narrative is not convincing or realistically fathomable. Where did these babies come from? More troubling is Cooney's background. 
As many historians have pointed out, he had no medical degree or training. His story is a very similar one of unconvincing philanthropy that we find surrounding some of our contemporary figures today that also do not have medical degrees. And then there is Marie Dressler, a Canadian silent film and Depression-era movie star. She adopted one of these incubator babies. Ah, celebrities and adoption. The official narrative conveniently leaves this out of her story and tells us that she may have had a daughter who died as a small child. But the photographs suggest otherwise. Did she adopt her incubator baby at one of these fairs? Were the fairs a front for illicit adoption of premature babies? Even if they were premature, did that mean they had no parents? Who owned and was responsible for these parks? And what happened to the babies once they grew and left the incubators? If something feels eerily wrong about the entire narrative surrounding these parks and orphans, it's because we are not being told the truth. Why were there hundreds of thousands of parentless children in the 19th century? Where did they come from? They were relocated all over the world. Europe, America, Russia, Australia, Canada. Why? Especially when most still had a living parent. If pregnancy out of wedlock was such a social stigma that resulted in such trauma, why would so many people put themselves in that position in the first place? Did the government really care about social morality enough to pass laws? And all the effort to build and maintain orphanages and orphan relocation networks, would this not burden governmental finances and administration systems? It certainly would have. But, you see, there was a greater purpose behind the government's worldwide agenda. Repopulation. The social narrative of chastity was nothing more than propaganda and justification for stealing children. The reason we see empty cities in the early 19th century is because they were in fact empty, void of population. And the reason they are bustling 30 years later is because orphans were shipped into these cities to repopulate them. You see, in the early 19th century, there was a worldwide reset of sorts through depopulation and then repopulation. The people we see in these photographs did not build this architecture. They inherited it, along with a lot of mud. Not only did they inherit it without a clue as to what it actually was and who it belonged to, but they were unknowingly complicit in repurposing pretty much all of these structures. I know, none of this is making much sense at the minute. You are probably wondering why on earth these cities were empty and full of mud. What happened that meant governments needed to repopulate the earth? And I know what you're thinking. This is all very intriguing, but what does this have to do with flat earth? You want to know more about the firmament, the sun and moon, and our stationary plane. Do not worry. Everything will become clearer as we continue our journey. The prevalent evidence of buried infrastructure, coupled with deserted cities, and a burgeoning industry of orphans is just a start. These are all necessary clues, hinting at some kind of cataclysm, but the real story hasn't truly begun yet. The stage had to be set first, and now it is ready. And even if you cannot see it yet, I know you feel it, viewer. The deserted cities, the buried architecture, and orphans all signal a looming darkness. There is a great black cloud in front of us, and I won't lie, we are heading right into the heart of it. And like I said before, we do not have much time. Come on, it's time for me to honor my promise and take you back to the future. Water, an inorganic, transparent and odorless chemical substance that covers 70% of the known Earth's surface. It is the driving life force 
behind the carbon-based organisms that flourish on our Earth. It borders and separates our lands and collects and solidifies at the inner and outer regions of our flat, stationary realm. God should have sent a message to the inhabitants of Earth and been precise and told them to watch the water, to meditate on its function and natural laws, because in their time, a great deception would be cast over them, like a cold shadow of an unknown, nefarious king. And maybe God did send this message in the form of a flood, but its truth was mythologized and buried, and the lie propagated in spite of it. Rest in water does not curve and convex. The natural laws of a resting body of water insist that it takes the exact shape of the container it fills and always finds and maintains a flat level. Resting water always rests flat and watching the water when we sit at vantage points, when journeying above in planes and before we take a sip from our drink, we must remember to never forget this law. Most of us instinctively understand the laws of water, and yet many continue their day-to-day -day willfully participating in the nonsensical, heliocentric hoax. But for us that know that our Earth is not a spinning planet in an infinite vacuum of space, the ones that have studied the sun diligently and realize that it is the sun that is moving and not the Earth, the ones that have plotted the illogical roots of flight paths on a globe model and concluded that the model is incorrect. The ones that know that the laws of density govern the rise and fall of objects and have studied vanishing points. The ones that have forsaken conventional telescopic lenses, pondered rainbows, sun dogs and the stars above us know that we reside within a dome firmament and there exists water above us and the ones that understand that our entire enclosed Earth system is governed by electromagnetism, frequency, and vibration that emanates from a central magnetic North Pole. We are the ones that scratch our heads and wonder how on Earth we got in this heliocentric mess in the first place. And if meditating on the stars in the water beyond our firmament long enough, and on the electromagnetism frequencies and vibrations that make them twinkle through so many shades of vibrant colors and geometric patterns, one might perhaps, just perhaps, ask, is there something more to electromagnetism? Something that has been missed or overlooked? Something untold or hidden? Electromagnetism is a fundamental force of Earth. The electromagnetic field takes the form of a torus in which all electromagnetism, frequency and vibration flows. A toroid is a revolving surface that takes the shape of a donut. Toroidal inductors and transformers are central to generating electric energy. There are many ways in which electromagnetism can be produced. We've looked at some before. We know that a magnetic field can produce electricity and that electricity can produce a magnetic field. It works both ways. Magnetism and electricity are inextricable. It is a dance of polarity. Electric charges either repel or attract each other. Magnetic poles attract or repel one another. For every North Pole, there is a corresponding South Pole. An electric current passing inside a wire creates a corresponding magnetic field outside of the wire. And an electric current is created in a loop of wire when it is moved toward or away from a magnetic field. Horseshoe magnets are powerful permanent magnets. Due to their shape, in which both magnetic poles are close together, a powerful, strong magnetic field is produced. The horseshoe magnet can also function as an electromagnet. The first ever electromagnet was invented in 1824, we are told, and was in the form of a horseshoe magnet. Its power was evident from the beginning. 
It weighed only 200 grams, but could lift 4 kilograms of iron. The key to the horseshoe magnet's power is the placement of its poles. You can see the magnetic field here, represented by the vector lines. If you look closely, you can see the concentration of the magnetic field is greater near the poles of the magnet. Since as far back as we can remember, we have been presented with and entertained ideas of the future. Not necessarily our future as individuals, but the future of humanity, technology and society at large. Whether it is in the form of Hollywood movies, you know the ones, the action films, the science fiction sagas and the animated kind or literature, music, and art exhibitions. In these, we see our technology taken to its limits. Crafts fly, computers live, robots help out, holographic screens decorate every room. Cities continue to grow upward into dominating skylines. Some can teleport, and space travel is now possible and the accepted norm. Outside of fiction, we also have sobering documentaries telling us where we are heading, usually featuring narration by an old man, lamenting the unstoppable path we are on. It's all very serious. We are destroying our planet, the only one we have. And we have political parties, non-governmental organizations, and the trusted voices and scientific, award-winning geniuses sharing similar messages. And really, when you look closer at both the fiction and the alleged facts, they all share the same underlying premise and principles. We are becoming so technologically advanced that the planet we reside on is no longer enough or can no longer sustain our activity. The advanced artificial intelligence systems, the flying crafts, the breakthroughs in cloning and medical beds mean that the natural world has suffered as a consequence. And depending on the type of genre you are entertaining, the solution is either 1. For humanity to perish as a result, perhaps destroyed by the very artificial intelligence systems it created in the first place, or perhaps by a natural, lung-choking virus that has mutated and is sweeping the earth to restore natural balance. Or two, for humans to say goodbye to their lonely little blue ball and head off into space in search of a new home. But you see, there is no globular planet and there is no space. And therefore all visions of the future are purely fictional and not particularly innocent. What we don't see emphasized in these visions of the future, however, is the potential of electromagnetism to transform all human life, technology, and society. Which is strange when you consider that all life, and the Earth itself, is impossible without electromagnetism. Why wouldn't visionaries want to explore this in more detail? Could it be that they are not allowed to? Could it be that they are afraid of something? Afraid of us connecting one too many dots, perhaps? And again, horseshoe magnets can act as powerful electromagnets. If a civilization was to advance technologically through the use of electromagnetism, then the horseshoe magnet would certainly have a tremendous role to play in that development. Yes. It certainly would. And it certainly did. The Horseshoe Magnet. The Arc de Triomphe. Yes, one of the most powerful electromagnets ever constructed.
Welcome to the future, except it's the past. The future came and went and we missed it. The magnificent architecture we see throughout our realm, in which the official liars and controllers of our world have termed historicist, neoclassical, renaissance, gothic and so on, all belong to one whole unified civilization. A civilization so developed they had harnessed the power of electromagnetism to such a high degree that they not only built these huge structures but also crafted them with utter finesse and beauty. A celebration of their own technological advancement. The structures were designed with the sole intention of harvesting and generating electromagnetic energy and distributing it across the world. Their cities, towns, an entire way of life ran and depended on the use of free, clean and powerful electromagnetic energy. The energy was harnessed and collected from the ionosphere above our heads through the use of antennas, spires, domes and towers. All the impossible structures we see today have been repurposed and rebranded by our controllers and the citizens of the 19th century. This is not a church. This is not a mosque. This is not a castle. And this is not a government building. These are generators, powerful and gargantuous. They would collect and generate the electromagnetic energy, which was then stored in huge power stations and distributed and redirected by sophisticated, advanced structures, one of which is a huge electromagnet, or what we've come to know as triumphal arches. The energy was stored in batteries and capacitors such as towers and obelisks. All cities were constructed across our realm in the form of one big interconnected power grid, much like a huge computer motherboard. I already know what you're thinking. What? He's finally lost it. He had us with Flat Earth, but this is just too much. I know, I know, I know. The backup programming is kicking in. But before you turn away to leave and cast aside your muddy boots, let me show you how it worked. As you know, we live on a flat stationary plane. At the center is a source of magnetism at the North Pole. And directly above this is Polaris, fixed at the central and highest point of a wondrous crystalline dome firmament. Beneath the firmament, different layers of atmosphere exist at different heights. The ionosphere starts at about 30 miles above Earth. It includes a thermosphere 
and the mesosphere. The ionosphere is an electrical atmosphere that is ionized by the sun's electromagnetism. It also forms the inner edge of the magnetosphere. I know a lot of big words and abstract concepts, but you are familiar with this process and have been witness to it every day for the entirety of your lives. As you can see, the vials here contain molecular gases that are present in the atmosphere above us. When an electromagnetic source, such as a Tesla coil, is applied within close proximity of these gases, the coil's magnetic field ionizes or charges these gases and the result is phosphorescent plasma. The gases become colorized. This is why our sky is primarily blue. Because the sun's electromagnetic presence ionizes the atmosphere and the result is colored plasma. When the sun is entering or exiting our region or what the liars of the world call sunrise and sunset, we see a variety of color gradients due to its distance from the ionosphere above us. When the sun is no longer journeying above our region, the sky loses its color and we can see the stars in the firmament beyond. Although the official scientists designate the ionosphere as an atmospheric layer, it is actually an ethereal layer. Ether is the fabric or element that carries electromagnetism. It connects everything in our realm. It is the fabric that makes the sun and moon and their concentric journey above our disk possible in the first place. Ether is the mysterious fifth element. It connects everything electromagnetically through vibrational energy. It is the glue, the web, the driving force behind absolutely everything. The four other elements, air, fire, water and earth, only exist because of the ether. They are expressions of ether's vibrations. Cymatics is a good example of ether's presence. The frequencies fed through the cladney plate make the sand or salt form precise and complex geometric shapes. The higher the frequency, the more complex the geometric pattern. But what is the conduit that takes the frequency's vibrations and allows the sand to take such shape? That is the ether at work. That's why we see fruits and vegetables that closely resemble cymatic patterns. It is the ether at work. All matter is ethereal and the shape and form of that matter are different expressions of the ether, determined by frequency and vibration. Ether is the bridge between electromagnetic frequency and vibrational energy and the form of matter itself. You could call it the Holy Spirit of God. The historical and scientific discourse of ether is a deliberately manipulated one. The enemy introduced the truth only to discredit and subsequently bury it. Some of the alleged figures of the past have written on ether. The so-called Aristotle called it the fifth element. James Clerk Maxwell the so-called father of electromagnetism spoke of the ether, stating, In several parts of this treatise, an attempt has been made to explain electromagnetic phenomena by means of mechanical action, transmitted from one body to another by means of a medium occupying the space between them. The undulatory theory of light also assumes the existence of a medium. We have now to show that the properties of the electromagnetic medium are identical with those of the luminiferous medium. The medium he refers to here is the ether. Albert Einstein and others successfully solidified the heliocentric model through fraudulent schools of scientific thought. But even Einstein could not deny the presence of ether. According to the general theory of relativity, space is endowed with physical qualities. In this sense, therefore, there exists an ether. According to the general theory of relativity, space without ether is unthinkable. 
For in such space there would not only be no propagation of light, but also no possibility of existence for the standards of space and time, measuring rods and clocks, nor therefore any space-time intervals in the physical sense. Even contemporary scientists, under the spell of heliocentrism, admit it is nonsensical to deny ether's existence. Today, the vacuum is recognized as a rich physical medium. A general theory of the vacuum is thus a theory of everything, a universal theory. It would be appropriate to call the vacuum ether once again. Returning to the ethereal ionosphere, as I said, this layer of ether above our heads is a constant sea of electromagnetism and is responsible for the color plasma above that we call the sky. The source of its electromagnetism is the sun. It is because of this ionized layer that we get ionospheric lightning in the form of sprites, which in turn influence the thunderstorms below. An ion is a particle, atom, or molecule with a net electrical charge. Electricity is a continuous flow of ions. The electrolytes in our body are ionized. Everything is connected by electromagnetism and the ether. Our highly developed and sophisticated historical ancestors not only understood the workings of the ionosphere and the ether, but they had developed methods to masterfully harvest it as a fuel to power the entire earth. And while the exact process by which they were able to extract the ether is deliberately hidden from us and remains unknown, the structural remains that humanity has since repurposed and reused as architecture offer us many clues as to how it all worked. The evidence is everywhere for those with eyes to see. And once you see it, it becomes so glaringly obvious that you'll kick yourself for never noticing in the first place. The matter is very complex and it will take time to really flesh out. So for now, let's have a closer look at some of these structures and I will introduce some basic concepts. As we continue our journey, we will explore everything in more detail. We see them everywhere. On top of all these magnificent structures, towers, spires and pinnacles that rise into piercing antennas. It was through these complex antennas that the ether was harvested. You see, after the great reset of the 1800s, the enemy fractured the old world's unified understanding of God and created multiple religions to try and hide God and justify the existence of such grand and beautiful technological structures. And I know this may trigger some people, but stay with me, I will not let you down. But for now, it is critical to understand that a lot of the religious icons that adorn and make up these antennas were never indicators of different religions in the old world, nor were they intended to be. They signaled something else entirely. They are usually made from copper and gold. Both are excellent conductors of electricity. In many of the structures we call cathedrals, the symmetrical spikes on the pinnacles worked in a similar fashion, extracting ether from the ionosphere. Once harvested, the energy would inevitably have been drawn down into the top larger portion of these domed structures. When examining many of the interiors of these domes, we come to realize that they rely heavily on symmetrical ornamentation. This is achieved by indentation or cavities in the masonry. In the world of electromagnetism, a cavity resonator works through symmetry to produce oscillation or vibration of energetic particles. Symmetrical shapes force energetic particles or ions to vibrate in a constant manner. Is this why we see perfect symmetrical ornamentation within the ceiling of many domed structures? It no doubt sounds absurd, but the majority of these structures also feature a smaller type of cavity resonator, or what is more appropriately termed cavity magnetrons, that offer some clarity as to the real function of these structures. A cavity magnetron is a high-powered vacuum tube that generates microwaves using the interaction of a stream of ions 
with a magnetic field while in the cavity resonator. A magnetron operates through a hollowed, symmetrical vacuum. It emits powerful microwaves that can act as a source of free energy. If you break the symmetry or close the vacuum, it no longer functions. But can you see the resemblance? These structures were never intended to hold glass within them. The controllers added the stained glass to the rose windows to shut off the magnetron's function. They closed our instruments of free energy. And they are everywhere in these structures. Interestingly, if you look at the geometry of entire sections of the structures themselves, then it becomes very evident that they functioned in their entirety like a cavity magnetron to generate energy. All cavity magnetrons consist of a central heated circular metal chamber in which the current leaves and it's called a cathode. Look at that word. Cathode. Does it remind you of another word? Cathedral cathode like with everything else they corrupt the truth and hide things in plain sight the controllers removed most of the cathodes integral to these cavity magnetrons but there are some structures today in which you can see traces of the old cathode still present the heavy reliance on symmetry and cavities within these structures is not coincidental the symmetrical ornamentation would have worked in a similar manner, causing the energetic particles to vibrate in a constant manner. The flowers within the squares can be understood as similar to acoustic resonators, working to vibrate the ions. It is here that the energy would have been continually manipulated into vibrational and electromagnetic energy of specific frequencies. Really look at these magnificent acoustic resonators. Could you craft one of these by hand today? and at such height. Why would an underdeveloped people spend so much of their time crafting such perfect symmetrical ornamentation? Especially if it had no function and was purely aesthetic. They wouldn't. The cavity resonators and magnetrons would have had to have worked in partnership with a central engine or reactor contained within all these structures. Both resonator and reactor are interesting words. Just like the words conductor, generator, creator, and the name Makator, they all contain the word Tor within their linguistic structure. They hold a linguistic memory and pay homage to the torus or toroidal field. The torus is the flow of electromagnetism. Without this flow of energy, there would be no life on Earth. No one can really know for sure, but some have suggested that the engine was probably similar to a fusion reactor. The traces of these engines can be found within all of the larger generators. The empty shell of where the engine used to reside is usually, but not always, octagonal. It's been right in front of our faces the whole time. The controllers remove the engines, sometimes repurposing the space as baptistries and bandstands, sometimes just leaving the base either barren or attempting to cover them up. We see these octagonal structures in cathedrals, government buildings, mosques, and detached bandstands. And unless they have been repurposed, these structures seem to hold no overall function. They do not contribute to the overall structure. They appear superfluous and unnecessary. Theories have surfaced that the engines or central technological mechanism was similar to a tokamak. And while I do not subscribe to this idea, which will become evident as to why later in our journey, for now we will use it for illustrative purposes. A tokamak is a powerful device 
that uses a magnetic field to produce plasma in the form of a torus. The contemporary tokamaks we see are used in thermonuclear fusion power. The tokamak's toroidal field, in conjunction with the vibrating ions from the ether, would have produced a highly conductive electromagnetic field of gases, called plasma, just like our sun and ionosphere. If those of the old world used anything closely resembling a tokamak's capability, then the result would have been an abundance of free, powerful, clean electromagnetic energy that could fuel entire cities and the entire earth. These were never churches, cathedrals, castles and parliament buildings. They were all huge engine generators. The controllers invented labels and terms such as Renaissance, Greco-Roman and so on to describe the style of these structures. But as you can see, all these magnificent, impossible structures all share the same fundamental structural principles and design, despite location, time period and cultures. And this is because they were created with the sole purpose of generating energy. And just because these structures were never used for prayer and worship does not mean they were not holy sites. The civilizations of the past had a relationship with the Source and the Holy Spirit, or the Ether, like no other. And they paid homage, reverence and thanks to it by constructing their generators with such splendor and beauty. And not only that, but they constructed the entirety of their structures statues and ornamentation in reverence of this gift, in reverence of the energy production that made their way of life possible in the first place. The Laurel Reef, which the satanic controllers have corrupted in their appropriation of the symbol and redesignation of it to represent Apollo and Lucifer, is in fact a toroidal coil. And we see the toroidal coil throughout the old world's infrastructure simultaneously having both a function and a celebration of this function. Electromagnetic coils are electrical conductors. They are used in applications where electric current interacts with a magnetic field. In devices such as generators, motors, inductors and transformers. Most coils take the form of a toroidal coil or spiral. Wire coils are used in conjunction with a magnet to produce powerful electromagnetism. The more turns of the wire, the stronger the magnetic field. Coils generate vortexes, which in turn create an electromagnetic field. It's all one interconnected system. And we see it everywhere. This is what columns and rotundas were used for. Powerful coils to generate electromagnetism and carry the current in loops. The torus is found at the base of pretty much every column found throughout our realm. It is everywhere. Look at the movement of electricity through a wire and the simultaneous magnetic field it produces. This is exactly the shape of a column. And we see this present in all of these gigantic and meticulously crafted columns. This is why we see the magnetic field represented at the top of a lot of columns. It's the movement of the ions in the magnetic field. It's the movement of the toroid 
and the toroidal vortex. As you saw, coils of copper wire are essential in electrifying the magnet. And I know what you want to say. That's great, but the columns and other structures you are referring to are made of stone. But you see, all of these impossible structures are made from a mixture of stone and metal. They used iron bars in their construction. Iron is magnetic. These iron rods run throughout the stone infrastructure and are complemented with copper and gold roofing. Copper and gold are strong conductors of electricity. Often we find entire statues, arches, domes and roofing made from a distinctive blue copper. Furthermore, the limestone, granite and dolomite stone is mixed with crystal silicon or quartz. Quartz has strong electric potential. The colonnades and arches we see everywhere were at once integral components to the overall electromagnetic infrastructure. While also constructed in geometric forms that mirror the flow of electromagnetic energy such as coil loops, horseshoe magnetic fields and toroidal vortexes. As with everything else constructed in the old world, they were both functional and crafted as a homage to that function. A lot of ethereal energy was stored in structures constructed from red bricks and concrete. Red bricks and concrete are excellent conductors of electricity. They operated as huge capacitors or batteries. According to new research, red bricks can be converted into energy storage units that can be charged to hold electricity like a battery and can store energy until required for powering devices. The key to this battery-like function inherent within red brick is the iron oxide. The development and use of red brick is so important and we will be returning to this subject much later in our journey. The really big red brick power stations and batteries were designated and recognizable by their white stripes such as St Pancras Railway Station in London and many other famous structures. We still carry this red and white stripe designation of power stations today and it is also an indicator for the magnet. Some were constructed of blue, black and brown with white stripes. Towers, obelisks and small clock towers functioned as the intermediate capacitors or batteries to store distribute and provide energy throughout the grid. The entire flat realm Earth was connected as one whole grid, a complex interconnected system of free energy production, distribution and consumption. And this entire grid was destabilized and deactivated somewhere between the 17th and 19th century. Power grids like this do not function on a spherical mass. Our historical ancestors knew that the earth they walked upon was flat. This type of futuristic technological advancement is the result of a civilization knowing exactly what type of earth they lived upon. They were not subject to the same satanic deceptions and abuses as we are. They were not raised believing they existed on a lonely globular rock spinning in the vacuum of space. The true, ethereal, electromagnetic properties of the Earth were not hidden from them. They knew there was a domed firmament above their heads. They studied it, they imitated its properties and understood its central relationship 
with the entire ethereal existence of electromagnetism. They revered the magnificence of its craft and showed utmost gratitude to the Source, to God and the ethereal Holy Spirit for giving them everything they needed. Look. Domes. Have you seen anything as overwhelmingly exquisite as this before? How have we lived our entire lives and not seriously considered the impossibility of these structures? How have we lived our entire lives walking amongst the skeletons of the future long forgotten? I know this is all a lot to take in and I know that the picture has not formed properly in your mind yet. It is hard to imagine an interconnected electromagnetic power grid of this size across the earth. And the technical nature of electromagnetism doesn't help. And I know that you're full of questions. Who were these people or beings that built these structures? Where did they go? And why were the power grids deactivated? What about all the religious iconography and art we see inside of the cathedrals and mosques? What about all the histories and photographs we have of the construction of these structures? What about the Romans and the Greeks? What about some of the grand mosques that have been constructed in recent times? And if what you're telling me is true, then how did they distribute and store all of this energy like you say? Was it similar to our Wi-Fi? and radio signals. We will get to all of these in good time. We have barely scratched the surface. But for now it is the last question that is important. How did they distribute and store all of this energy? And in what form? For you see, our sophisticated historical ancestors did something that we, as a society, have come to neglect. They watched the water and they watched it closely, right here on Earth and up above, beyond the firmament. Come on, let me show you. T. 
tip tap goes the rain, spitting on my window pane. Drip drip from the trees, sodden earthy and soggy leaves. Splosh splash puddle pools, jumping on their way to schools. Onomatopoeia. The formation or use of words that imitate the sounds associated with the object or actions they refer to. The property of a word of sounding like what it represents. Water has many. The interdependent relationship between water and sound is so fundamental to our connection and understanding of water. The rain patters and drums, the waves roar, the brook murmurs and whispers, the puddles of mud squelch, that it is intrinsically woven into the very linguistic code of our language. Many have explored the powerful connection between sound and water. We have Masuro Emoto and his study exploring the impact of sound on the molecular structure of water. We have those that like to play around with cymatics. There is Peter Davy, a saxophone player who invented a device that boils water with sonic waves. The innovative use of sound coupled with water seems to have no end. So much so that in recent times, biologists are discovering that ultrasonic water can even treat the most resistant of infections and heal wounds at rapid pace. And in a future where electromagnetism was harnessed with the utmost innovation, water, sound and frequency had to have a major role to play. And of course it did. They wanted us to know that it did. And not just the water here on Earth. They were telling us to look up and above. They wanted us to know that what they had achieved right here on Earth was only possible because they had studied what existed above. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. And let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. Some criticize the King James translation of the Bible for its use of the word firmament. But in the original Hebrew, the word is rakia, which translates directly as firmament. In the New International Version, it is called the vault. In the English Standard Version, it is an expanse. In the Good News Translation, it is dome. What is important, however, is that in all translations, and in the original Hebrew, the notion of the firmament, or vault, separating the waters above from the waters below, does not change and remains consistent. There is water above our realm. The telescope is an interesting instrument, both at once an apparatus for discovery and simultaneously a weapon of deceit. There are two primary types of telescope, the refractor and the reflector. A refractor uses an objective lens, usually a convex lens, and a reflector utilizes a single or a combination of curved mirrors to reflect light and form an image. Many reflector telescopes use either a concave mirror or a parabolic mirror. This is what a reflection looks like in these mirrors. The eyes we were born with and which we see the world through are convex lenses. We do not witness the world through curved mirror reflections. This is Jupiter as seen through a reflecting Newtonian telescope. And despite the slight spherical distortion caused by the reflective mirrors, this is still not what NASA has shown us. Your mind immediately sees a planet, because you have been programmed, since birth, to associate an image like this with the notion of a planet. Just in the same way you associate the moon with a ball of rock by default.
But as you can see here, both refracting and reflecting telescopes produce images similar to the Nikon P900. The Nikon lenses have been criticized by some astronomers as lacking the power to really see the luminaries above. But as you can see here, there is not much difference between the Nikon and both types of telescope. And in each we see that Jupiter is radiating some kind of light of its own. Both amateur and professional astronomers present footage such as this. But look what happens next. The astronomers here are using imaging processing software to turn their raw images and footage which display a circular object in the sky above us radiating its own light into a NASA style planet. And this type of doctored, processed image is not what we see with our own eyes through these lenses. I am not saying that this is deliberate deception. Astronomy is a practice of its own. But it is very important to never confuse the highly edited images and footage we receive with reality. And it is also worth being mindful of those that are being very manipulative. They are usually the astronomers with the paid sponsorship from magazines and websites. It is also important to note that what we call planets are not actually planets. They are wandering stars, and all of the wandering stars are of a similar nature to the moon. Unlike the rest of the stars above our firmament, their course and journey above us is not fixed and consistent. Their paths deviate from the concentric paths that the rest of the stars consistently make around Polares. And the reason for this is because they are not located within the waters beyond the firmament. They are very different, and their function is way more occult, and their significance to life here on Earth much more important than we realize. We will be returning to the true nature of the so-called planets and moon later. Back to the waters. Arcturus is one of the brightest stars in the sky. Here is Science Magazine's artistic impression of the star. And now here is Arcturus as seen through a refracting telescope. There is no resemblance. What we see through this telescope footage is really similar to what we see when you zoom in on the stars above with a powerful Nikon camera. Many criticize the refracting telescope because it can produce chromatic aberration. Chromatic aberration is a failure of the lens to focus all color to the same point. The result can be purple fringing, and we see that here. Photographs can suffer from chromatic aberration. Interestingly, the Nikon does not produce the same chromatic aberration when zooming in on Arcturus. Therefore, you could say that the Nikon is actually more reliable and stable. Through both the telescopic lens and the Nikon, Arcturus is pulsing, shifting, rippling. It is dancing geometry. Many will jump up from their seats and exclaim, it's because of atmospheric distortion and light pollution. It's because Arcturus is so far away. But if it is atmospheric distortion, then why do all the stars display their own unique geometry and light patterns? They should all distort in a unified, consistent manner. It is not atmospheric distortion. The stars are pockets of sonoluminescence in the water above. They are self-illuminating, radiating their own light and frequencies in the waters above. Our own convex lensed eyes tell us that there is some kind of water above. We see it in the stars and when rockets accidentally hit the firmament. And, like I said before, just because the so-called planets or wandering stars and the moon appear spherical does not mean they are. They are not synonymous with the stars in the water beyond. They are something else entirely. Our advanced predecessors wanted us to watch the stars. 
They wanted us to understand that electromagnetic vibration and frequency produce pockets of sonoluminescence in the waters above. They were pointing it out because they wanted us to know that water was the key to unlocking the real potential of electromagnetic energy. They wanted us to know that once harnessed, the ethereal electromagnetic energy could be fused with water, so it could be stored and distributed. And once produced, the water could be manipulated, enhanced and elevated to a level of new possibilities through the use of vibration, frequency and sound itself. Their civilization depended on the industry of what we will call the living waters. Their technological advancement enabled them to transform the entire earth into a power grid. But this grid was only possible because of water. The civilization of the future was an electromagnetic water world. Canals are no great secret. They are found everywhere across our realm, both the great and the small. Most of the great canals around our earth are connected to the ocean. Salt water is an excellent conductor of electricity. Sodium chloride is ionized. We have the Corinth Canal, connected to the Aegean Sea. We have the Panama Canal that connects both the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. The Suez Canal connects with the Mediterranean Sea. And there is the Volga Don Canal, connecting the Azov Sea, Caspian Sea and Black Sea with the major oceanic networks. All of the canals built before the 1920s were not built by us or those in the history books. We inherited them. And while the official narrative tells us that the Volga Don was finished during the 1950s, its construction actually began back in the 16th century. All narratives surrounding the construction of these canals is purely fabricated. And I will show you how much later in our journey. Once you start paying attention, it becomes very evident that most continents and countries feature a combination of canals and rivers that span the entirety of the land itself. The citizens of the old world utilize the oceans and rivers to create a grid of interconnected waterways to provide water to all of their areas of habitation. In order to pass difficult sections and keep the supply going, they would build aqueducts and viaducts. Sometimes these were constructed with the purpose of energizing the water as it passed through and into different areas. And that is why many were designed with symmetrical archer vault structures. The Romans did not build these structures. The entire infrastructure of so many cities found across our realm are designed around canal systems. Look at Amsterdam from above. The precise geometric grid lines here are not roads. They are canals, and the sole purpose was to supply water from one area to another. The water was stored and manipulated for a variety of purposes in reservoirs, water towers, pumping stations, cisterns, and other structures. The water also functioned to provide necessary balance, a complex grid of electromagnetic production, distribution, and consumption would generate a lot of heat and magnetism. Water provided not only a balance of dire magnetism, but also ensured the entire grid did not overheat. When looking at all the magnificent generators and other instruments of power from the old world, we can always find water nearby or the remains of water storage. Sometimes this is hidden primarily underground. Many do not realize that many so-called Victorian cisterns and reservoirs run very far under a lot of our cities, and other times it is a central characteristic feature of these structures, an example of which is what the controllers have redesignated as castle moats. The electromagnetic water grid was not just an energized version of what we are already familiar with in our cities and towns. It was much, much, much more. It was way more magnificent, impressive, and futuristic than we could even imagine. The grid was connected to central, bigger power stations, or what is more appropriately termed star stations. Sometimes these were isolated stations 
and other times they comprise entire cities. We are going to have to fly to a higher altitude for this. I need to show you. Hold on tight now and keep your eyes open. Look. The sole existence, let alone construction, of these star structures is almost beyond our comprehension. As you saw, they are found everywhere across our realm, with undeviating geometric consistency. A wondrous impossibility. Perhaps they had some kind of technology that allowed them to view huge areas of land from above while planning and building. They were never forts. That is a fairy tale invented by our controllers. The stunning geometric precision and symmetry of the star structures would most likely have functioned to enhance the power of the generators and to etherize the water, or turn the water into living, energized water. We can see from comparing some of these ruined sites, and some left a little more intact, that water would have been present throughout the structure. Before the controllers destroyed and drained most of these structures, they were full of water. 
They were connected to rivers and canals and the oceans. They were a key component of the entire power grid. The star structures are fractals of symmetrical geometry, just like many of the ceilings of these huge energy generators. And, like the acoustic cavity magnetrons and resonators, the symmetrical sharp diagonal walls would have caused the ions to perpetually vibrate. Old plans and illustrations, which have no doubt been edited or manipulated in some way or another, offer suggestion as to how complex, integrated and essential the star geometry was to the entire grid. Look at Paris here. It isn't obvious at first glance, but upon closer inspection, we come to realize that the entirety of Paris was itself a star station or a star city. And like with everything else constructed in the old world, these structures were at once functional and a celebration of the source of their innovation. Look closer at the star geometry here. Can you see the resemblance? The snowflake? Do you remember what happened in Masuro Amoto's experiment on water? Ethereal vibration expressing itself through water's molecular structure. Those of the old world had perfected this science. They knew the key to releasing electromagnetism's potential was through sound and water. Just imagine what they were able to achieve. Sound, vibration and frequency was just as integral to the success of their technology as water was. Those of the old world did not hide their adoration for sound. Traces of this love for sound are everywhere. These structures were literally instruments of power. Or as the so-called Goethe put it so succinctly elsewhere, music is liquid architecture. Architecture is frozen music. This is why so many generators, capacitors, power stations and intermediates feature holes, pediments, dentils, indentations and complex 3D ornamentation. They were structural openings to manipulate sound waves, the vibrations and acoustics so they could tune the electromagnetic energy in conjunction with the water in a variety of ways to achieve different results. They were similar to the aerophone instruments such as the flute, the pipe, the recorder, the bassoon and the trumpet. The old world revered the geometry of the star because it was through the study of the stars in the waters above that they learned the power of fusing electromagnetism, vibration and frequency with water itself. They all work harmoniously and in concert with one another. This interconnected and interdependent energetic relationship is what makes the stars and all life itself possible in the first place. Look a little closer at the dancing geometry of the sonoluminescent stars beyond the firmament. Do they remind you of something else? That's right, all of the magnetrons, or what we've come to call rose windows, were designed to mirror the cymatic patterns of ether's vibrations in water itself. Artist Tanya Harris was onto something in 2013 when she turned her attention to studying and recording the silent resonant frequency of churches. By placing water inside of a loudspeaker, she was able to discover the hidden geometry of these resonant frequencies. The results showed that even the silence within these structures produced strong cymatic patterns. And again, can you see the resemblance? Others have applied the same technique and studied the cymatic patterns displayed when bells chimed within the structures. Look at the patterns. Magnetrons. This is why so many magnificent rose windows resemble cymatic patterns so closely. This is why they look like the petrified pulsations of a star. The entire ceilings of many cathedrals also mirror this sacred cymatic geometry. This is why so many of the structures contain huge bells and chiming clocks. The tolling bells would emit powerful vibrations and frequencies and influence an entire area's water supply. The sound would influence the molecular structure of the water which was then used for a variety of purposes. And that's not all. 
Many of these structures also housed another wonder of the world. The King of Sound. The Organ. Have you ever stopped to look at some of the great organs before? These were not constructed by ordinary people in the 19th, 18th, 17th and 16th centuries. Like the structures they reside in, they are a marvel of elegance and majesty. The most powerful sound instrument in the world. The specific organ sound waves of low and high frequencies would no doubt have enabled those of the old world to manipulate the ethereal energy in ways they saw fit. The Magnetron Rose windows that would not have contained glass would amplify these sound waves, which in turn would influence the molecular structure and properties of the etherized living water. Organs would have had multiple uses, perhaps providing entire towns with specific resonant frequencies for good health and prosperity. The specific functions of the organ have been deliberately hidden and withheld from our knowledge. Interestingly, the official history states that the first organs of the world were water organs, in which the power source pushing the air is derived by water from a natural source or by a manual pump. No doubt a deceptive half-truth disguising the instrument's true interaction with water. And like I said before, most of these structures had areas nearby to store and hold large quantities of water. Many of the structures feature underground cavities or huge cisterns, some of which have been drained and some kept intact. Sometimes the cistern was located apart from and outside of the structure. The controllers have redesignated many of these areas as Roman baths. That's why Bath Cathedral in England is located right next to the Roman baths. The water was also stored in red brick power stations, capacitors, or water towers, open rectangular sites, reservoirs, wells, and step wells. This is why step wells were constructed with precise geometric patterns. Again, the symmetrical structures here work to encourage oscillation or vibration of the ions. They kept the water electromagnetically charged and the aqueducts and viaducts would have worked in a similar fashion. It is likely that a lot of the huge electromagnets we see scattered across our realm would have actually straddled passing water, much like we see on the Volga Don Canal, even though it's unlikely that the Volga Arch is original and that many roads themselves were constructed during the Great Reset. It is likely that the inheritors of the 19th century were instructed to drain and fill many of the tributaries that once carried water. That's why we see drained castle moats and star stations. Perhaps that's what a lot of the surplus mud we see during this period was used for. Perhaps a lot of homes and buildings were constructed with underground chambers to store their own personal supply of living water, and these areas were destroyed filled in and forever hidden with vast amounts of mud during the 19th century. The use of electromagnetism, sound waves and water would have had endless applications and uses in the old world, most of which we will never know about. But many structural remains do offer a lot of clues. The abundance of remarkable and impossible stately homes, halls and manors found throughout our realm all point to the mass-scale farming practices of the old world. We travel miles to marvel at their beauty and grandeur, but more impressive than the structures themselves are their gardens and water gardens. We have the Palace of Versailles, Schwetzingen Palace, the Royal Palace of Caserta, Niffenberg Palace, Herrenhausen Palace. Even today, they still retain much of their splendor and brilliance. But it's when we look at some of the old plans of these areas that we realize just how otherworldly these sites were. They were never constructed 
to house the elite. They were the farms of old. Look at the gardens. They are cymatic gardens. Even from these old illustrated plans, we can see just how gargantuous these farms were. Microcosmic grid systems, suggestive of the entire larger power grid itself. The cymatic gardens were likely grids cultivated with sound and the living water to grow food, herbs and who knows what else. Even contemporary scientists openly acknowledge that sound waves strongly influence the growth of fruit, vegetables and crops. And to this day, some of these structures retain a lot of their glory when viewed from above. The Palace of Versailles, a wondrous geometric marvel. A collection of impossible structures, extraordinary cymatic gardens and water systems. Let's venture closer into the Palace of Versailles and have a look. Hold on now. Wait, what? This is not the Palace of Versailles. I really need to fix this thing. It's been acting up a lot lately. Where are we? Wait a minute. I recognize this place. Memories from a long time ago. This is Chatsworth House in the Peak District, England. Oh well, this should do. Come on, let's see what we can find. Chatsworth House was completed in 1708, we are told. Its story, much like the story of the entire Peak District, is a fabrication, a complete lie. The place has changed much over the years. It is situated beneath two large bodies of water, the Emperor and Swiss Lake. The water from the lakes is channeled across a broken aqueduct before falling 79 feet and meandering gently down the hills, in complex waterways and running right into Chatsworth Estate. The waters feed the estate's own lakes, rivers and streams through a series of runways and a multitude of complex tunnels beneath the estate and the structure itself. Due to the estate's repurposing, much of this remains hidden, but you can see the tunnels quite clearly here, snaking their way down. It is one interconnected water system. Waterways deliver themselves into waterfalls at the impressive rockery before continuing on their journey. All of the water gathers into a central, rectangular front piece which feeds the Emperor Fountain. The water then continues underground until it pours into the River Derwent a 66-mile-long tributary of the River Trent, which runs throughout the Peak District. While much of the estate has undergone some serious restoration, which is actually a fancy, deceptive word for criminal gutting and destruction of technology, there are a lot of haunting remains of its former glory. It is important to note that unlike many of the huge energy generators, Chatsworth House was probably partially occupied. By farmers, that is. The central engine was located off-site and has been subsequently removed and repurposed as a larder to store hunted game. This magnificent, gorgeous structure would have functioned as a small generator, which also contained a small engine in its centre. It was repurposed as the stables, the horses of the 19th century clearly lived better lives than most of the population. Above, atop of the hill next to the Emperor and Swiss Lake, we can see the quadruple capacitor or water tower. This was repurposed as a hunting tower. But, stalking the 105 acre grounds, a visitor with eyes to see might spot some unusual sights one of which is the half-ruined obelisk hidden away in the tangled overgrowth at the bottom of the hill below the lake. The official, controlled history that visitors receive when touring Chatsworth conveniently leaves out any mention of the obelisk. For you see, the hunting tower was not Chatsworth's only capacitor. The entire estate needed constant water storage to fulfill its energetic requirements and purposes. There are many odd structures dotted around that remain unexplained. And then there is this, the Cascade. 
a true little wonder. The dome, a series of toroidal circles that rise to meet the smaller copper dome. They tread carefully here, making sure they force a distorted history on you. But, as always, they cannot help themselves. They just have to tell you, in their own roundabout controlled manner. As the placard states, water can be made to flow over the roof and out of 13 spouts. Some of these spouts are crafted in the form of immaculate stone dolphins and giant fish. There are even hidden jets in the floor, they tell us. The water is received from the lakes above and is used twice more in its journey to meet the river Derwent below. Once in the South Lawn Fountain and again the private West Garden. But look closer at what they acknowledge. Each step of the cascade is different from the one below and above it to vary the sound of the falling water. This was allegedly built in 1703. Why would an 18th century people be concerned with varying the sound of falling water? How did they even have the knowledge and skills to manipulate the sound of water like this? And it's everywhere in the estate. The waterways, streams and rivers all meander gently down to rest briefly at ponds and lakes before continuing their journey toward the River Derwent. Their journey is one of such splendid sounds. As you begin to traverse the labyrinthine passages of our corrupted history, you will inevitably meet the lithographs, renderings, engravings, illustrations and paintings. How easy it is to lie when there is no photographic or visual evidence, just artistic interpretation. We would never accept illustrations as reliable sources of information today, so why do we accept them as historically accurate? And while these are not to be trusted, devoting some time to browsing their particulars can yield some interesting insights. For instance, the fountain here looks wildly out of proportion. Did it used to jet water more powerfully? And some would claim artistic exaggeration. But if you dig a little deeper, you come to learn that the original Emperor Fountain constructed in 1843, was able to jet water at a height of 296 feet. What? How? This is the 19th century we're talking about. And like I said, they cannot help themselves. Even Wikipedia states that the water power of the fountain found a practical use in generating Chatsworth's electricity. There it is barely hidden in plain sight, and as we continue browsing these little illustrations, we stumble across it. An old engraving of Chatsworth from above. Look at the size of this. Cymatic gardens, rows and rows of crops, large bodies of water that are no longer there. And again, many would claim artistic exaggeration, the unreliability and inaccuracy of illustrations, and rightly so. But when we look at Chatsworth from above on Google Earth, what is this we find? Shadows on the ground across from the river? No, these are the markings of old infrastructure that was torn down. The markings suggest there was once a bridge here, a bridge we see in the illustration. Look a little closer, an octagon with the clear outline of an old generator. So yes, the illustration is a lie. The estate was much, much larger than depicted here. In 2018, there was a heat wave in England and the old markings of Chatsworth's former glory started appearing in the grounds themselves. They had to acknowledge it, sometimes mud and lies are not enough to bury the truth. Chatsworth was a huge farm in the old world. As I said before, 
The illustrations and paintings are not to be trusted. More often than not, they are used as tools of deception against us. But as you see here, they do have a tendency to backfire on the controllers. Just like with the plans of star stations and cities, our own technological access to tools such as Google Earth validate these old plans and illustrations as half-truths. You can bet good money that even the plans and illustrations are only giving us a fraction of the full picture, just like here with the plan of Chatsworth. And it's in Chatsworth that we encounter the first of many acts of barbaric desecration by the hands of the enemy. Chatsworth's great conservatory stood immense until destroyed in 1920. It was 84 meters long and 20 meters high and constructed, they say, in 1840 before the establishment of automatic glass manufacturing. Huge interconnected tunnels and water pipes collected under the ground of the structure to provide heating via boilers and hot water. An engineering feat as impossible as the construction of the structure itself. It was designed by Chatsworth's gardener, Joseph Paxton. Paxton is a phantom that haunts the pages of the history books. Paxton's story is one of fortunate circumstance, daring innovation and success. It is, unfortunately, a dishonest story, an unconvincing fiction. We are told that Paxton secured a gardening role when he was 20 years old, while working at Chiswick Gardens. And it was here that he encountered William Cavendish, the Duke of Devonshire, who was so impressed by young Paxton's horticultural abilities that he hired him as head gardener of Chatsworth House. Paxton is responsible for creating the following. Chatsworth's Arboretum, its Rockery, the Emperor Fountain, you remember, the fountain that sprayed water into the air at twice the height of Nelson's column. The Great Conservatory. He was responsible for cultivating the Cavendish banana, the most consumed banana in the world today, and designing railway stations all over the Peak District. What a talented and productive young man. Paxton's achievements, however, did not end with the banana and the conservatory. The fast doesn't end here. What a tangled web we weave when setting out to deceive. Paxton's success with Chatsworth led him to design the infamous Crystal Palace of London, just in time for the Great Exhibition of 1851. It was originally constructed in Hyde Park for the fair. It was constructed in just over a year. An engineering feat never again repeated. It was made from more than a thousand iron bars and its overall mass comprised of over 4,000 tons of iron. The Chance Brothers Glassworks in Smethwick provided the 300,000 sheets of glass. Remember, this was before automatic glass manufacturing. This is the glassworks in which the glass was produced. A simple maths equation gives us an average of 822 glass panes produced every day, seven days a week, for a year. Right here, in this factory. This was Paxton's initial plan sketch for the structure. He went from this to this in a year. Furthermore, the entire Crystal Palace was able to house gigantic trees, and they had to board a lot of the glass panes up and cover a lot of the top of the structure during the World's Fair exhibition because the interior of the structure became too hot. Wouldn't Paxton, who designed the Chatsworth Conservatory, know that a huge glass palace would produce immense heat? The entire narrative soon dissolves into stupidity when we realize that a year later, in 1852, they dismantled the Crystal Palace and moved the entire structure to Sydenham, in southeast London, where it was rebuilt with two additional huge water towers at either end of the monstrous structure. Interestingly, no photographic evidence of the original Hyde Park Palace exists, just illustrations. 
Wouldn't the structure have been the focus of many photographers during the opening of the great exhibition of 1851, the first of its kind? It is highly likely there were either two of these crystal palaces in London and both destroyed, or the High Park Palace is just an outright lie. Interestingly, a few years after its relocation to Sydenham, this map of the palace was produced, all designed at the hand of our genius gardener. He struggled with the water supply, we are told. After all, supplying 12,000 fountains, two of which shot water 250 feet into the air, and the various cascades would be a difficult task to achieve. But clearly not for Paxton. He made it happen. Interestingly, the Crystal Palace also featured one of these impossible, grand, and spectacular organs. Oh, and if that wasn't enough, while Mr. Paxton was redesigning the Crystal Palace at Sydenham, he was also designing the glorious Mentmore Towers for none other than Baron Mayer Rothschild. Who would have thought that a random, young, 20-something gardener would go on to be responsible for some of the most impossible and impressive engineering feats in history. Let's also not forget about his banana. Paxton is an example of the enemy's laziness when it comes to hiding our true history. It is not fathomable or even possible for the citizens of the 19th century to have even built these structures, let alone assign their inception to one sole man. The Crystal Palace and its gardens, just like Chatsworth, were huge farming grids that used to live in water in conjunction with sound and electromagnetic energy to cultivate a whole range of wondrous produce. Kew Gardens in London is another example. The abundant electromagnetic energy was able to produce conditions of heat with ease and the vibrational frequencies encouraged growth. Perhaps that's why Crystal Palace housed a grand organ, utilizing frequencies and vibrations to enable the growth of produce. And that's why the controllers were able to assign the cultivation of the banana, an exotic fruit, to a fabricated Englishman. The technology already established in England was able to grow many things with ease. Among other impressive horticultural achievements attributed to Paxton's genius were the perfect pineapples, another tropical fruit he grew at Chatsworth. He grew enormous lily pads, which could hold the weight of a human. He grew gigantic sequoia redwoods at Chatsworth, which usually only thrive in humid conditions. He grew them with ease, and many of these redwoods remain today, a spectacular sight to behold. It's probably worth noting that among Paxton's many other talents, Wikipedia also tells us that he became quite skilled in moving gigantic trees, as well as gigantic crystal palaces. The largest of these trees weigh in 7,000 kilograms. How? With horse and cart? Why are humans so gullible? They destroyed the beautiful and impossible Chatsworth Conservatory in 1920. As the Duke's son said in a letter to his father, they blew off well over 200 pounds of explosives to tear it down. So it must have been well built. The structures of the old world were built to stand for centuries. What a great shame. The lies surrounding the Peak District do not end with Paxton. The entire national park was one gigantic interconnected electromagnetic water system of the old world. It was most likely one of Britain's primary suppliers of farming goods. The national park boasts one of the largest collections of stately homes, halls and manors, all of which would have functioned as huge farms. It was also a regional retreat that specialized in healing. Yes, that's right, healing. The Peak District is home to two large towns, Matlock and Buxton. Buxton is famous for its bottled water, 
and Matlock is renowned for its historical baths. Even today, both towns boast an enviable collection of old world structures. We see an abundance of old generators, domed pavilion structures, capacitors, colonnades, columns, bandstands, gardens and water systems. Overlooking the town of Matlock is River Castle. Its silhouetted frame and turrets stand regal in the distance. It is a derelict structure and has been derelict for over a century. The curious public are not allowed near the structure. They tell us it was built very quickly by a Mr. John Smedley. Smedley was, we are told, an industrialist. By the 1850s, he had become the driving force behind Matlock's hydropathic industry. Hydropathy is the practice of healing and curing diseases through the use of water. The official narrative states that Smedley built Smedley's Hydro, which sits on Smedley Street in Matlock. It is now a government council building. Smedley's Hydro was just one of the hydropathies in the region. At one point, we are told, there were over 20 hydropathic establishments in the region. Just look at these structures. Smedley did not build the hydro. Its structure, an immense water tower, evades his capabilities and the capabilities of all the 19th century citizens. The citizens of the 19th century Peak District inherited all of this infrastructure, and the controllers of our realm knew that they needed to squash any possibility of it being used for its original intended purposes, or for any of the inheritors to discover the truth. It was just too obvious, and soon someone amongst the crowd might start putting two and two together. So they did what they do best and employed a puppet. But unlike Paxton, who was able to achieve fame and fortune for taking all of the credit, Smedley had a different role to play. A role that many puppets in our society today still play. His mission was to carefully control the introduction of hydropathy, only for it to be declared primitive or fraudulent, and then subsequently buried and eradicated as a serious practice. His story is a very similar story to another enemy puppet that has gained a lot more attention over the years. I too once fell for the lies surrounding this man's story. The hydropathies were able to accommodate hundreds of patients, and they were tremendously successful in curing a whole host of diseases and issues, ranging from inflammation and bilious attacks to paralysis, rheumatism, and fevers. This was conducted through an array of different bathing techniques, applying dripping sheets as bandages, and fusing electricity, sound waves, and water. There were, as one newspaper reported, electric bells throughout the buildings. No doubt the actual potential of hydropathy was never fully expressed in Smedley's array of hydros, but they nonetheless helped people tremendously, and they were a huge success, so the controllers temporarily profited financially. The hydros healed and increased the well-being of people through water and its fusion with sound, vibration, frequency, and electricity. Look at the electric treatment menu from one of the old brochures. Options for high-powered parabolic reflector, electric ionization, and high-frequency treatment. Smedley also demonstrated the ability of etherized water to heat entire rooms in a profound way. The fernery at the hydro had a water heating system built into its walls and always maintained a constant temperature of 65 degrees, even when the room was filled with a crowd of 350 or so visitors. The temperature never deviated. How was this kind of technology available in the 19th century, and yet today we do not have access to this kind of sophisticated heating? Historians and journalists of the time would deliberately smear Smedley, casting hydropathy as pseudoscience comparable with homeopathy. Smedley had many battles with the burgeoning medical industry, 
And after his death, the hydros were purchased and the structural alterations began. Like Tesla, Smedley played his role and successfully introduced the science of the old world to have it debunked, tarnished and sidelined forever. Hydropathy today is regarded as nothing more than a relaxing spa venture. All of its original applications of frequency and electricity have been eradicated from the practice. Smedley's role playing allowed the controllers to justify the entire water grid system of the Peak District, successfully preventing the current 19th century and further subsequent generations from questioning its presence. The remains of the grid today are so evident. You can sit and relax to the soothing sound of water falling over the turreted regal Derwent Reservoir, which connects the entire region for its branching rivers and canals. You can stroll around shopping inside of old power stations and at old pumping stations. And in every area of the region, there are wonders waiting to be discovered. Not only in the larger towns do we find old fountains that once provided the living waters, but also in the remote villages. Tucked away, we find an old dry fountain. Look, the Lord's gift, a bittersweet joy to behold. The citizens of the old world unlock the power of electromagnetic water by studying the stars above in the firmament. The stars above taught them that the key to manipulating the ethereal energy they harnessed from the ionosphere was through water, sound waves, vibration and frequency. They honoured this gift by constructing domes, by crafting star cities, cymatic magnetrons and praising the Lord and Holy Spirit for the living waters they received in return. They understood the firmament as both scientists and disciples. Viewer, I am hoping the picture is starting to become clearer in your mind. And you will inevitably start to see things in a different light when pondering all of these impossible structures. It is not a coincidence that some structures like the Colosseum are also referred to as amphitheaters. Have you seen them from above? They look like speakers. Amphitheater is an interesting word. An amp is a unit of electric current, and an amplifier is a device that increases signal, especially microwaves and audio. And no doubt you will start to put two and two together in terms of some of the inventions that we were allowed to play around with before they were discarded as antique in their efficiency. But time is of the essence. We could ponder examples of the old world's electromagnetic water grid system for hours. But I encourage you to get out and hunt down these structures yourself and to document them in your own time. We have to move on. We need to start... Wait, what? You want to know if these came from the old world? Yes, they did. And they are extremely important the inevitable ticking of the clock, a deeply unsettling instrument, but unavoidable. I need to show you one more missing piece of the electromagnetic puzzle first, and then we will take a closer look at these timekeeping instruments. Come on, let's keep moving. A missing piece of the puzzle. When observing the old world structures today, there is a great sense of absence and alteration. Structures have evidently been altered and changed drastically over the last 200 or so years. And when journeying across our realm and studying these structures, a tremendous sense of absence persists. Something is missing. The concept of ethereal harvesting through these wondrous antennas is not enough. It is not concrete enough to complete the picture. Something else was once present that made the entire technological grid possible. This, of course, is the key technological component of these structures. The engine, 
and the central mechanisms that made them function in the first place. The engines were, of course, not tokamaks. A tokamak is a crude and bass instrument. It is a design of the new world. It does not belong in the old world. It would have had no place in their structures. Their sophistication and finesse would not have relied on such ugliness, on such primitiveness. What is undeniable, however, are the parallels between the tokamak's fundamental octagonal form and the old world's love for the octagon. It is very likely that the octagonal formation is an essential component when generating a toroidal vortex. We see the octagon everywhere in the old world. Octagonal geometry underpins many of the structure's fundamental formations. And the peculiar octagonal structures everywhere are not by mistake. They are what they seem, empty shells that once house something else. This sense of emptiness is everywhere and remains unexplained. So many towers and domes rise to smaller, hollow domed cupolas. Why are they hollow? Why would an earlier civilization waste so much time and energy constructing such a seemingly superfluous and useless structure? But they didn't, did they? A lot of these empty areas are always directly below the antennas. And although not all of these crucial empty structures are octagonal, most are, and they are always situated in key areas, like under central antennas, beneath domed resonators, in the center of closed, symmetrical courtyards, or detached and just outside the bigger generators. And when reflecting on such perfectly wrought geometry, the absence is tangible. There used to be some kind of cylinder or apparatus contained within this space. Furthermore, we also find various historical relics that closely resemble the old world structural style. In these relics we see that empty cylinders or vessels are an integral part of the object. Could these be miniature functional objects that mirror the form of the larger empty spaces we see in the old world structures? Perhaps a kind of micro household object that enabled access to the wider power grid's energy production? Did the larger structures themselves contain similar cylinders within? In many old photographs, the cupolas and octagonal spaces are already emptied. But there do remain a few images and illustrations that can offer a little insight as to what was present before. In some we see a type of cylinder, and in others we see some kind of orb or container. Due to the lack of images, it is hard to present a consistent finding. And so much has been altered, and in ways that are almost impossible to recognize. For instance, this is an 1880 illustration of the so-called completion of Cologne Cathedral. It focuses on the top of one of these spires. The wooden boards here are scaffolding. As you can see, the tops of these spires open, revealing some kind of cylinder. This is a model of the area of the spire that we see in the illustration. It was put outside of the cathedral to give tourists an idea as to just how large these spires are. An impossibility for citizens of the 19th century. The men in this illustration are not completing the final spire of the cathedral. They are removing whatever existed in the container at its apex. And it begs the question as to how many other aspects and features of these structures open in similar ways. And why do they open? What did they contain? Interestingly, it is the esoteric and occult that provide some clues. Alchemy 
was an arcane natural philosophy or proto-scientific tradition. Its central focus was chrysopia, or the transmutation of base metals into noble metals. From its inception in ancient Egyptian, Greek, Indian and Middle Eastern culture, the field of alchemy, we are told, was obsessed with turning base metals into gold and a maniacal obsession with creating the elixir of life to achieve immortality. We have all heard of the medieval Nicholas Flamel and the Philosopher's Stone. It is a field of inquiry steeped in a rich fabric of occultism, Kabbalah mysticism and magic. It wasn't until the mid-18th century that alchemy was divorced from its occultism and transformed into the burgeoning field of chemistry. But there was a small occult revival during the 19th century that continued into the 20th century. In 1922, a mysterious text was written by an equally mysterious figure. The Mystery of the Cathedrals by Falconelli, a French alchemist, we are told. To this day, the identity of Falconelli is still debated. No one knows who he truly was. And like many mysterious figures in the history books, his name appears to be an anagrammatic play on words. Falcon is a reference to Vulcan, the Roman god of fire, and Eli a reference to El, the Canaanite word for god. It is evidently a work of one or more Freemasons. But nonetheless, its alchemical reading of the wondrous and magnificent structures we call cathedrals is potently original and offers many insights and half-truths. And it's in Falconelli's reading of the statue of Ophorus that was taken from Notre Dame Cathedral and destroyed that he begins to offer the reader some truths. As the legend goes, Ophorus was a strong giant but with a dull mind. His intentions were always good. He wanted to serve the most powerful king on earth. He was sent to the court of a mighty king to serve him. One day, the king, hearing a singer say the devil's name, made the sign of the cross with terror. Why do you make that sign? Ophorus asked. Because I fear the devil, the king replied. If you fear him, you are not as powerful as him, Ophorus reasoned. I want to serve the devil. And so he did, and enrolled among Satan's servants. One day, the servants met a cross by the side of the road, and the devil ordered them to turn around. Why is that? The curious Ophorus asked. Because I fear the image of Christ, the devil replied. If you fear him, you are not as powerful as him, Ophorus reasoned. I want to enter the service of Christ, Ophorus exclaimed, and passed by the cross and went on his way. On his way, Ophorus met a hermit, he asked the hermit where he could find Christ. Everywhere, the hermit replied. The hermit knew the type of dull giant he was dealing with, and he knew he would not take to prayer. So he led Ophorus to a violent river and said, The poor people who have crossed this water have drowned. Stay here and carry them on your strong shoulders. If you do this, Christ will recognize you as his servant. And so he did. Ophorus spent his days and nights carrying people across the river. One night, overwhelmed with fatigue, Ophorus received a knock on his door. It was a child who wanted to cross. Ophorus took him on his shoulders and began crossing the river. But as he reached the middle, the river became a furious torrent. The waves swelled and Ophorus began to buckle. In fear of letting the child fall, Ophorus uprooted a tree to lean on, but the child was becoming heavier and heavier. Ophorus began to fear the child would drown. He lifted his head up and asked, Child, why do you make yourself so heavy? It seems to me that I carry the world. The child replied, Not only do you carry the world, you carry the one that made the world. I am Christ. As a reward, I baptize you in the name of the Father in my own name and in the name of the Holy Spirit. From now on, you will be called Christopher. Christopher walked the earth for the rest of his days 
to teach the word of Christ. Christopher, the one who bears Christ for the masses. In his focus on Offerus, however, Falconelli reveals a certain key to unlock another layer of meaning in the legend's symbolic expression. In his enigmatic manner, Falconelli writes, Christopher stands for Chrysope, who carries the gold. From then on, we better understand the great importance of the symbol, so eloquent, of Saint Christopher. It is the hieroglyph of solar sulfur, Jesus, or the nascent gold, raised on mercurial waves and then carried by the clean energy of this mercury to the degree of power possessed by the elixir. Cryptic indeed, almost impenetrable prose. But let's look at this passage a little closer. Falconelli is stating that in the symbolic legend, Jesus, or Christ, is the nascent gold. Nascent means coming into being. The word's etymological roots stem from the concept of beginning or birth. Nascent gold here, or the solar sulfur, is not just gold, it is gold growing into its full potential. The final section of the excerpt explains why the gold is growing because it is being carried on the mercurial waves. The mercurial waves here refer to the metal mercury. Gold is achieving its potential because of the clean energy of mercury. Falconelli explains that mercury's color is an emblematic gray, and that explains why many of the representations of St. Christopher coat him in that color. We will return to the legend of Ophora soon, but first let's look closer at mercury. Mercury is of the utmost importance when it comes to understanding not only the mechanics behind the old world's technology, but also in understanding our own contemporary time in which we find ourselves traversing the enigmatic landscape of symbols that have shaped our understanding of history and our place in it. The symbol here represents the element hydrogyros. Its literal translation from the Greek means silver water. Hydrogyros has many names. It was also called Quicksilver. Today it is referred to as Mercury. The alchemical symbol is precisely the same symbol used in classical astrology to represent the so-called planet Mercury. Pure or native Mercury is an extremely rare element in the Earth's crust. It's primarily retrieved from cinnabar, a bright scarlet or red pigmented form of mercury sulfide. Cinnabar is the most common source ore for refining mercury. Both Wikipedia and World Atlas tell us that mercury is the 66th most abundant element in Earth's crust. In its pure state, mercury is a silver-like liquid. It is the only metal that is liquid at standard temperature and pressure. It has a freezing point of minus 38.83 degrees and a boiling point of 356.73 degrees. It is an excellent conductor of electricity. Its uses are primarily electrical based. It has a primary role in fluorescent lighting. Its other uses include thermometers and dental amalgams. Mercury dissolves all metals, including gold and silver, to form amalgams. The only exception is iron. It is also used in vaccines. Governmental, medical, and pharmaceutical industries declared mercury toxic in the early 21st century, gradually phasing out its use in medicine and leading some countries to completely ban the element. In some countries, it is illegal to trade mercury. Before this, mercury was a staple in certain traditional medical treatments, such as the traditional Chinese medicine. And while I do not dispute mercury's potential toxicity when injected into the body, the concerns surrounding its hazardous potential are largely overblown. All metals, especially when injected and taken in excess, are toxic. High iron, copper, zinc, and aluminium levels in the body contribute towards a whole host of disease, arguably more so than mercury. And yet the governments of our world have not banned aluminium foil, they have not stopped fortifying grains with iron oxide, and zinc and copper supplements are available to purchase with ease and without constraint on the value of dosage a person can expose themselves to with such supplements. 
Could there be other undisclosed reasons for demonizing and restricting Mercury? Let's look a little closer at this extraordinary element's electromagnetic potential. Mercury is an electrically conductive liquid, and because of this, it has historically been applied to create light switches, electrodes in some batteries, as a gas to create fluorescent lighting, and, most interestingly, it was used, we are told, in lighthouses. According to the mainstream historical narrative, lighthouse keepers were responsible for keeping the massive lens at the top of the lighthouse spinning all day every day. A spinning lens turning at a set speed made the light flash. They usually achieved this by setting the lens on wheels or bearings attached to clockworks that the keeper would periodically wind. In the late 19th century, some keepers, sick to death with having to keep winding the clockwork, began floating their lenses in liquid mercury. The lens's metal base spun more easily in the mercury, which helped the light rotate faster with less frequent winding. It is a practice still in use in some lighthouses today. It is evident from its structure that the lighthouse's sole function was not just to light the way for ships. It was either one of its functions among many others, or just an inherited act of repurposement. Many lighthouses are constructed in the familiar octagonal structure, Many have the red and white stripes, indicative of power stations. Many still have their antennas, and they were situated right next to the water. It is obvious that they had a similar role as many of the old world's power stations. We find repurposed and rebranded all across our realm. Lindau Lighthouse in Germany is a fascinating example. We see all the familiar dentils and holes suggestive of vibration and frequency manipulation. We see the octagonal cupola. They have replaced the original antenna with new world junk, and oddly the structure has a clock. And although those of the old world made the most advanced clocks ever seen, the presence of a clock face here appears superfluous. Perhaps the abundance of clock faces we see on so many of the old world structures and towers are actually repurposed steam gauges that used to be present to measure the pressure of the energetic water. The intricate and complex design of these lighthouses would have been a feat of engineering for those of the 19th century and their predecessors, unless those that came before the 19th century were technologically advanced, which of course they were. Mercury's role in lens rotation is a subtle example of repurposement. It is very likely that the complex apparatus at the top of these lighthouses were modified as illuminated lenses during the Great Reset, and what existed before operated to extract ethereal energy. For most of the 19th century, gas and oil burners were used as sources of light in these structures. And yet look at the size of some of these lenses. Look at the complexity of the designs. All to house light running on gas and oil? I don't think so. The history of the lighthouse is of utmost importance because it, one, provides evidence of mercury being present in some kind of apparatus directly located in a cupola, the very spot we see emptied on so many structures today. And two, because Mercury's presence here was to enable the lenses to spin and rotate more easily. And that's very interesting, because look what happens when you apply magnetism and electricity to Mercury. It rotates and creates a vortex, either clockwise or anti-clockwise, depending on the application of the current. A vortex, as you know, is an integral expression of a toroidal field. There are three main types of vortexes, electrical, magnetic, and electromagnetic. 
in addition to Mercury's electromagnetic potential and its susceptibility to form a vortex when under the influence of current, the silver water also has another unrecognized application. Look. No wonder Mercury is demonized and illegal. As you can see, Mercury is able to provide even a homemade television antenna with the ability to convert radio frequency alternating currents to extract a television signal. Antennas can be designed to transmit and receive electromagnetic waves in all directions equally. And you could hypothesize that the orbs on the old world's antennas contained mercury. But again, it is no secret that mercury amalgamates with gold and other metals. An amalgam is an alloy of mercury and another metal. Mercury strongly amalgamates with gold, copper, silver, and many other metals. The only common exception is iron. The orbs could not have contained mercury because, as you saw, Mercury would have scavenged the gold, silver and copper and amalgamated with the metals. We do not see any evidence of that here. They function strictly as aerial antennas. But if all of these structures contain some type of engine or apparatus, similar to the Fresnel lenses we see in lighthouses, with Mercury continually forming a vortex, then we would have a setup that enabled the antennas to extract ethereal energy and transmit strong electromagnetic signals. Just as Falconelli reveals in his reading of St. Christopher, it was the mercury that enabled the gold to achieve its potential. It is highly likely that the absent cylinders, vessels and containers that were removed from these structures and which were usually present within the octagonal geometric structures contained mercury and it raises the question if some lighthouses are still running their lenses off of mercury today wouldn't they still extract ethereal energy no they would not and once again falconelli tells us why as falconelli states elsewhere in the mystery of the cathedrals the dissolution of sulfur or in other words its absorption by mercury provided the pretext for a very different emblems but the resulting body, homogeneous and perfectly prepared, retains the name philosophical mercury. It is the first class matter or compound, which requires only a gradual cooking process to transform itself first into red sulfur, then into elixir, and then in the third time into the universal medicine. As Falconelli makes clear, transforming pure mercury into a red, sulfurous state is the first step. And as mentioned previously, cinnabar, or mercury sulfide, is red. And as we see here on representations of St. Christopher's robes, he wears one half grey to indicate mercury, and another half red, which is indicative of the red sulfur. It is the transformed state of mercury that allows the gold, here represented as Christ, to achieve its full potential or, to keep it consistent with the legend, to reach the masses. What Falconelli is actually telling us is that in able to distribute this clean electromagnetic energy via golden-orbed finials or antennas 
a special kind of mercury had to be present. This is what was contained within the vessels and engines. And it is likely that it was this unique mercury that enabled the extraction of the ethereal energy from above in the first place. Perhaps it is just a coincidence, if you believe in such a thing, but it is interesting that many of the smaller vessel-like relics we see have markings inside the containers that are red. Perhaps a homage to the substance they once contained. Now I know what you want to say. Come on, you are turning a molehill into a mountain. You're basing this off a few passages from the ramblings of a Masonic deceiver. How do we really know that those of the old world were the alchemists of old, and that Mercury was central to their advanced technology? Bear with me, I will expose this so-called Falconelli for the Masonic deceiver he is further down the line. But, like I said before, there are many half-truths here that we can extract. And you must ask, why this cryptic text about the mystery of the cathedrals focuses primarily on explaining the structures and their symbolism in alchemical terms. For you see, St. Christopher is not the only symbolic expression of Mercury and Gold's relationship. Like with their adoration of sound and water, the Old World expressed this alchemical relationship in many symbols. In fact, the symbols were so prevalent that the enemy had to appropriate them and use them as weapons of control and deceit, otherwise the Great Reset of the 19th century would have failed. The enemy's genius stems from its appropriation, redesignation, and deliberate obscuring of symbols, to the point where tracing the history and true meaning of one symbol in particular becomes a monumental feat. The abundance of lions and eagles we see throughout the old world, primarily in the form of statues, relates to the elements of gold and mercury. As Falconelli states, the lion is the sign of gold. It represents a terrestrial and fixed force, while the eagle represents the airy and volatile force, or the mercury. When the two champions come together, they attack, repel, and tear each other apart with energy, until the antagonists become one body, the animated mercury. The fusion of the fixed gold and the volatile mercury create the griffin, in which the lion, or the gold, represented the fixed, basic part of the compound, which in contact with the adverse volatility, loses the best part of itself, the part that has characterized its shape, that is, in hieroglyphic language, the head. And like the lion and eagle, we see the griffin everywhere in the old world. Like St. Christopher, the griffin is symbolic of the alchemical concoction and combination of mercury and gold that powered the old world's technology. The symbolic association of animals and beasts with alchemy has been eradicated from history, primarily due to the appropriation of these animals as heraldic symbols of royalty and nobility. These are the animals that adorn national imperial seals, as we see attributed to the Roman Empire, the British Imperial Empire, the United States, and so on, an act of post-colonial domination over the old world, the appropriation of its symbolism and eradication of its history through falsified narrative. Furthermore, the chemical, alchemical, and cosmological symbol used to represent Mercury is immediately recognizable for its conflation of two of the most widely used symbols throughout history and culture. That is, the cross and the crescent moon. It is openly acknowledged that at one point, all religious symbolism predated its current religious use and application, and belonged to another culture and represented something different during different historical eras. But just because this is openly declared does not mean it makes any sense. Were our historical ancestors, and their own historical ancestors, 
really that uninspired that they needed to recycle already established symbols? Or are we not being told the truth once again? The conflation of Christian and Islamic symbolism and culture is so prevalent across our realm that upon closer inspection, it begins to appear quite absurd. If we are to believe the official historical narrative, that is. If we believe the narrative of the Crusades and Ottoman Habsburg Wars, of the continual warring between West and East, then the presence of the crescent symbolism displayed on many so-called medieval European coat of arms and crests indeed makes no sense. Perhaps this is just more cultural appropriation, but the narrative becomes very unconvincing when we turn our attention to the structures themselves. Why was the Hagia Sophia Holy Grand Mosque originally constructed as the Church of Hagia Sophia by the so-called Roman Empire? It remained a church, we are told, for almost a thousand years. Its four minarets were constructed after the Ottoman Empire took the region. But look at its original design. It does not resemble a traditional cathedral whatsoever. And we see this over and over again. The Cathedral of Cordoba in Spain, originally erected as a mosque in the 8th century and then converted to a cathedral in the 13th century. We see right here the conflation of both styles of East and West. Interestingly, the structure also features the red and white striped arches, indicative of power stations that we find throughout so many impossible structures. And even without their unconvincing narratives of structures passing between cultures, we still see the presence of both styles in many structures that do not have this narrative attached to them. St. Mark's Basilica and the Doge's Palace in Venice look extremely Eastern, as does the Brighton Pavilion in England. These structures were impossible for all of those, East and West, in the official narrative, unless they had advanced technology which the narrative tells us they did not. The official narrative tells us tales of architects being inspired and influenced by the structures of East and West alike. But remember, at the time these structures were built, the people didn't have accessible transportation. Journeying between continents and countries took weeks, and they had no cameras to document the structures in order to be able to replicate them with such accuracy in the first place. Why don't synagogues have their own unique particular style, like mosques and cathedrals? We see this fusion of architectural style everywhere. We see water pumping stations that resemble cathedrals. We see water towers that resemble castle turrets. We see cathedrals that also resemble official government buildings. All these structures belong to one whole unified civilization. That's why we find so many ruined cathedrals in the Middle East. They were destroyed and ruined during the Great Reset and after to solidify the falsified narrative. That's why we see the crescent moon in old 19th century photographs in areas it should not be. This is Brazil. Look closer. Even today, Brazil's Muslim population comprises a total of 1% of the country. So why is this crescent present at the top of one of these antennas in the 19th century? Why is it present in San Francisco in 1905? Why do we see many structural antennas composed of both the cross and crescent moon? In many of the old photographs, we see many structures without any religious symbolism, but just standard antennas. And what about all the unusual antennas we see? Many of the antennas functioned as symmetrical instruments to enhance ether extraction and to transmit energy to other antennas. They were never signs of different religious factions in the old world. They were most likely later designated these meanings to fracture the unification of the old world and its understanding of God. Even the mainstream narrative admits that it was not until the 19th century that the crescent moon even became associated with the Ottoman Empire, and it wasn't until 1950 that the symbol became the emblem of Islam. The symbols of the crescent and cross 
are much more complex than most realize. In the context of the antennas, they are likely a symbolic homage to the alchemical mercury that made them function in the first place. But the crescent and cross also have broader implications that are related to the holy, energetic and ethereal workings of our realm. We will be returning to these symbols later. This is not meant to discredit the meaning of these symbols today. Symbols evolve over time, but this evolution was carefully orchestrated by our controllers. It is also not to discredit God. And this point is crucial. I understand that much of this may trigger some people, but it is imperative to understand that religion, in an institutional sense, was created by our controllers as a means of control. Many religious organizations today are corrupt and use religion as a front when their true allegiance lies with the psychopathic controllers of our realm. Religion was an essential tool of deception to justify the old world's infrastructure. Religion is not synonymous with an understanding of God, faith and prayer. And it is also not to discredit the life of the Son of God. No, and this is crucial and you will see why later in our journey. And in many a sense, this is what Christ tried to teach people, to see through the deception and manipulation. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, Pray to thy father which is in secret. You see, the scriptures are more accurate than most understand. They are at once historical accounts, instruction manuals for living, and sacred texts of prophecy. There are a handful of texts that are so important that the enemy has been desperately trying to steer people away from them in recent times. And you will see why this is of utmost importance later in our journey. Stay with me. The best is yet to come. And it doesn't end there. The basis for the alchemical symbol of Mercury, we are told, was a caduceus. And we see the caduceus throughout the remains of the old world. Another symbol appropriated by the enemy, adorning many coat of arms and adopted by centralized, corrupted medical industries that have been responsible for mass crimes against humanity that continues today. It is not a coincidence that the same mercury that the symbol represented is injected into humans via vaccines to disrupt their entire methylation cycle, resulting in widespread autism and a whole host of neurological and metabolic disorders. The caduceus illustrates clearly how both Roman and ancient Greek mythology serve the enemy as a tool of deception. In Roman mythology, the caduceus staff was carried in the left hand of the god Mercury. The Roman Mercury was a god of financial gain, commerce, communication and messages. In Greek mythology, the staff is carried by Hermes. Hermes was a god of travelers, merchants and commerce. The fabricated mythologies allowed the enemy to obscure the caduceus's true association with the elemental Mercury while also permitting them the usual sick, hiding in plain sight, mocking ritual by linking their medical industries with the god of financial gain and commerce. As Falconelli writes, the snake indicates the incisive and dissolving nature of Mercury. This reptile is the aspect of Mercury in its first state, and the golden wand is a corporeal sulfur added to it. It is the philosophical Mercury and the caduceus as its symbol. Not only does the caduceus represent the mercury elixir, essential for the transmission of electromagnetic energy, but the dueling snakes form a spiral coil, representative of the energy pathway and the vortex. The rod represents the gold and sulfur, but it is also reminiscent of the antennas themselves. And just as the mythologies hide in plain sight, the wings here represent the connection the communication, the messages, the signals between antennas in the electromagnetic grid and also the connection between the antennas and the ether itself. After all, the Roman god Mercury was known as the messenger of the gods.
and it's hiding in plain sight throughout our chemical art and illustration. We see the eagle and the lion, we see the caduceus, and we see similar geometries and objects that adorn the top of the old world structures. And yet it is still difficult to imagine the energy grid. And even more difficult to imagine is the level of labor required to remove all the engines and vessels, to destroy and hide enough of the old world, and to begin rewriting history in order for the Great Reset to have been a success. What we are seeing in the 19th and early 20th century is the final stages of the reset. There was a transitory period, and like any transition phase, the period still utilized some of the old world's technology that it was trying to phase out. And like I said, the enemy is lazy. They really should have done away with these photographs and footage. Look. Most of these images were taken during the world's fairs of the 19th century and at the turn of the 20th century. Any electrician will testify to just how impossible illumination in this time period and on this scale would be. What an absolute nightmare to wire. But they didn't need complex wiring, did they? How did they have moving sidewalks during this period? We also see this technology on display in the burgeoning American amusement parks of the early 20th century. There is a reason they called them electric parks. In fact, the reference to electricity can be found everywhere amongst repurposed old world sites, even in the unlikeliest of places. Even in this transition phase of the reset, these environments look glorious. This is with most of the water grid already destroyed. Just imagine what they were able to achieve. 
So many of the major symbolic icons of our time can be traced back to the mercury that made this electromagnetic, technological old world possible in the first place. Interestingly, in his reading of Offerus, or St. Christopher, as a mercurial carrier, Falconelli takes his Masonic trickery of half-truths and deceptions to the limit. He begins discussing Offerus's belt as depicted by Julian Champagne, whose painting of Offerus hangs in Jean Lamant's mansion, what Falconelli calls one of the most attractive and rare philosophical residences. The painting depicts Offerus wearing a belt stitched with crisscross lines. It is important to note that none of the other famous artistic renditions of Offerus depict him wearing this belt. Falconelli exclaims that the artist did even better than the rest. Under the inspiration of the hermetic scientist who has commissioned the painting, the artist depicted Offerus tightened by a wide belt at the level of his abdomen. It is this belt, Falconelli writes, that gives St. Christopher his true esoteric character. Listen very carefully to what he states next. According to some documents kept in the archives of the Lalamont Mansion, we know that Jean Lalamont belonged to the alchemical brotherhood of the Knights of the Round Table. What we are going to say here cannot be taught. Offerus's belt is the sign that all philosophers recognize as the external mark that indicates the extreme, intrinsic purity of their mercurial substance. It is a sign that the old authors called the Seal of Hermes, the Star of the Meiji, the Bear Cub, the constellation in which the Pole Star is found. Comparing Ophiris's belt and the Bear constellation by the Pole Star, or what is known as Ursa Major, or the Big Dipper, at first provides no insight as to what Falconelli is referring to. Is this just the rambling of an insane cryptic mason, or are we missing something? But if you begin to trace the pattern on the belt, then another hidden and familiar pattern begins to emerge within the pattern itself. When documented throughout the year, at each season, the Big Dipper constellation also forms this pattern, the symbol of the swastika. A now infamous symbol of evil, what many do not know is that according to the official narrative, the swastika was one of the most widely used symbols throughout history and different cultures. It is an important symbol in Asian countries, representing Hinduism, Jainism and Buddhism. It was used by the so-called ancient Greeks and Romans, the Druids, the Celts, Native Americans, early Christians and so on. We see it in mosaics, rock churches, bracelets, rose windows, crosses, pottery, clothing and flags. We see it everywhere throughout time and culture. Interestingly, Swedish and Norwegian power companies used the symbol in the late 1800s and early 1900s to represent electric power stations and hydroelectric stations. This connection cannot be purely coincidental. The task of erasing memory and history is not an easy feat. It takes time. Out of all the symbols, this is the one that the enemy had to corrupt and dilute the most by appropriation. Not just because of its now lost association with electromagnetism, but because, as Falconelli let slip, its original association with Mercury's involvement in the old world's power grid. Like the Caduceus's spiraling snakes, it depicts a vortex that Mercury produces in the presence of electromagnetism. The swastika is the vortex. It also represents another vortex, the one below Polaris and the Big Dipper, at the center. The same vortex that NASA has teased hiding in plain sight here on Earth and in their representation of other planets' poles. It is the same vortex that Mercator and others documented in maps and writing the whirlpool surrounding Rupus Nigra and located at the North Pole. Interestingly, scientists have recently discovered large natural stores of the so-called toxin mercury at the North Pole. They are worried about it melting and causing toxicity. Of course they are. As Kevin Schaefer writes in the National Geographic article, it turns out that not only is there mercury in permafrost, but the Arctic is also the biggest pool of mercury on the planet. Is this another mocking on their behalf, or is there actually a vast amount of mercury at the north? 
We will return to this much later in our journey. The noble metals and their original location on Earth are very important, and it is the scriptures that hold the answer. The old world knew. They knew the Earth they walked upon better than anyone else. They knew the alchemical metals, gold, iron, copper, mercury, and so on, could be fused in ways that allowed them to access the ethereal electromagnetic energy. They knew that Ophorus, the alchemical mercury, could elevate the Christ, the alchemical gold, and carry him to the masses. It is not a coincidence that the path Ophorus carried Christ was across the river, across water. The legend of Ophorus is a symbolic and metaphoric totality of the old world's energy system. You have a question, and I have a feeling I know what you're going to say. You want to ask about the maps, Makata and such. If they have fabricated history, distorted so much symbolic meaning, and lied about those that came before, how can we trust these old maps and accounts of the North? How do we know that Hyperborea is a real place, and that there is a vortex in the center? That's the spirit, an important question. Unfortunately, we cannot trust the maps, and I need to show you why. And it's now time to talk about the clocks. For you see, there is another map, hidden and long forgotten, the oldest map of them all. And it's not perfect by any means, but it's all we have. Come, it's time to lift another veil. Midway upon the journey of our life, I found myself within a forest dark, for the straightforward path had been lost. And during my journey, as I made my way through the tangled labyrinthine paths of deception, looking for the center of truth, I met a brilliant woman who taught me many a flat fact. But out of all of her flat facts, it was one fact that struck a chord. She showed me the maps of old, and asked me to find the key anomaly, the one error that all maps contained. I pointed to the varying representations of unknown land masses, to Hyperborea. She shook her head. No, find the glitch. We live on a flat plane. Our world is an electromagnetic terrarium, surrounded by an ethereal sea of water. And like all terrariums, after initial creation, they begin to form their own self-sustaining atmosphere. The sun and the moon journey above our flat realm in concentric spirals. There are five prominent circles of latitude, we are told. We have the Arctic Circle, closest to the center. The Tropic of Cancer, at 23.5 degrees latitude, in the Northern Hemisphere. The Equator, at 0 degree latitude. The Tropic of Capricorn at 23.5 degrees latitude in the Southern Hemisphere and the Antarctic Circle. The Sun journeys from the equator at the March equinox up in concentric spirals to the Tropic of Cancer. When the Sun is in this position, the Northern Hemisphere experiences summer and the Southern Hemisphere experiences winter. After which, the Sun turns and begins making its way back to the equator. The word tropic stems from the Latin word tropicus, which means pertaining to a turn. The sun journeys back, taking the same concentric spiral path, and reaches the equator again. It then keeps going and reaches the Tropic of Capricorn. When the sun is in this position, the southern hemisphere experiences summer, and the northern hemisphere experiences winter. After a time, the sun turns and begins making its way back to the equator for the March equinox. The equinox occurs when the sun is journeying the circle of the equator, and those living along this line of latitude will see the sun directly overhead at a 90 degree angle at solar noon. The March equinox marks a season of spring in the northern hemisphere, and the September equinox marks a season of autumn. If you live in the southern hemisphere, this is reversed, and the September equinox marks spring and the March equinox, autumn. It is important to know that the sun never reaches the Arctic Circle, nor does it reach the Antarctic Circle. It never reaches the poles. It journeys to the tropic circles and then turns back. 
the point at which the sun reaches its most northerly and southerly excursion relative to the equator is called the solstice. Solstice comes from the Latin word solstitium, which means point at which the sun seems to stand still. And indeed, many do note that the sun seems to stop on the solstices. And this is because, in a sense, it does. It reaches the most northerly and southerly excursion and turns back. But why the Tropic of Cancer and Capricorn? Who names these circles of latitude? Our historical ancestors did. They had clocks that not only told them the seconds of the hour, the hours in the day, but also the moment of dusk and dawn and the current phase of the moon. Their clocks understood the true time, the bigger picture. They understood the celestial clock. The stars above us, beyond our firmament, and in the waters above, revolve at a constant one degree every four minutes, from east to west, that is, anti-clockwise. This means they revolve at 15 degrees each hour. 15 degrees multiplied by 24 hours is 360, a full circle. The stars above are fixed. They do not stray from their anti-clockwise journey, but revolve and complete a full circle every day. Our ancient, historical ancestors knew this. They assigned the stars above into fixed constellations. They divided the 360 degree circle of the sky above into 12 divisional arcs of 30 degrees, in which each constellation of the zodiac resides in. They designated each constellation in each 30 degree arc with an anthropomorphic symbol, most of which are animals. Zodiac is an interesting word. Zodiac, the arcs of the zoo. Yes, the parallels with Noah's Ark are strikingly obvious. Each constellation of the zodiac moves from its fixed position in the waters above at one degree every 72 years. The stars in the circle above us are fixed in their positions, but every 72 years, the entire circle shifts one degree. This is what is called the precession of the equinox. Remember, each arc is 30 degrees. If we multiply 72 with 30, we get 2,160 years. It takes 2,160 years for the circle above to shift one whole arc. Astronomers call this an age, and this is what is meant by entering or the dawn of a new age. As Wikipedia tells us, the Tropic of Cancer and Capricorn were named such because many years ago, in the days before Christ, the days before BC, the sun was in the constellation of Cancer at the June solstice, and the sun was in the constellation of Capricorn at the December solstice. What does it mean for the sun to be in a given constellation during the solstice? It means the position of the sun in the sky at solar noon. Of course, during solar noon, we would not actually be able to see the stars in the firmament beyond. Therefore, to discern the sun's position relative to the constellations requires either one, a thorough understanding of the stars and their positions above. Our ancient ancestors, we are told, created star charts and used devices such as astrolabes. Or two, computer technology that is able to map and overlap the sun's position against the backdrop of the stars and constellations at solar noon. The sun's presence in the constellation of a given zodiac sign means exactly as it sounds. At solar noon, on the day of the solstice, the sun should be in front of a given constellation. Look closer at the zodiac wheel featured on the dial of these clocks. Here we see that both the constellations of Cancer and Capricorn are polar opposites to one another. These are the names of the two lines of latitude on the maps and that we use to discern the sun's most northerly and southerly excursion above our flat plain. All historical cartographic world maps display both these circles of latitude as Cancer and Capricorn. We see it here on Mercator's maps. On the Ortelius. On the Rouge. On the Urbano Monte. Cartographic maps combine so-called science with aesthetics to communicate spatial information effectively. They strive to be accurate. 
and we still use this designation of Cancer and Capricorn for these circles of latitude on our cartographic maps today. Google Earth also uses these designations. But why? As Wikipedia states, when this line of latitude was named in the last centuries BC, the sun was in the constellation Cancer at the June solstice, the time each year that the sun reaches its zenith at this latitude. Similarly, when the Tropic of Capricorn was named, the sun was in the constellation of Capricorn at the December solstice. And the wheel of the zodiac makes this very easy to understand. For instance, if the sun is in any given constellation at solar noon on the June solstice, then its counterpart on the December solstice will always be in the constellation opposite to the June sign. And this is represented with a straight vertical line. If, for instance, the sun was in the constellation of Aries at the June solstice, then it will appear in the constellation of Libra in the December solstice. If the sun was in the constellation of Pisces at the June solstice, then it would be in the constellation of Virgo during the December solstice. These signs are, in a sense, bound in their opposition to one another. And this is where it becomes interesting. The vertical line here represents the tropic circles and their respective constellations during the solstices. But they are governed by another circle of latitude, the equator. On the will, this is represented by the horizontal line. And you'll see that the lines form a cross. The equator and the tropic circles are bound in unison by this cross. Remember, the zodiac is the clock face of the circle of stars above us. When one turns anti-clockwise, the rest follow. And just like the signs of the solstices, the left hand of the horizontal line here represents the constellation the sun is in during the March equinox, and the right hand side representative of the sign during the September equinox. And it is the left hand side of the cross, the March equinox, or what is referred to as the vernal equinox, and its zodiac sign, which acts as a reference point for the entire celestial coordinate system. It's called the first point of Aries. The naming of this reference point after the sign Aries is arbitrary, or so they say. We also use it as a reference point for naming the age we are in. And if we start in the age of Aries, we can illustrate the precession of the equinox and the designation of constellations to their corresponding circles of latitude quite clearly. For instance, if the sun is in the constellation of Aries during the March equinox, then we have the Tropic of Cancer and Capricorn. We also see that the sun will be in the constellation of Libra during the September equinox. Now the stars above us are revolving anti-clockwise from their usual fixed positions at one degree every 72 years and a whole zodiac arc every 2160 years. So let's jump 2160 years to the age of Pisces. The sun is, of course, in Pisces during the March equinox. We have the Tropic of Gemini and Sagittarius, and the sun in Virgo during the September equinox. You'll no doubt have noticed that the wheel represented here turns clockwise, and that's because it's a representation of the constellations, as if your view was outside of the firmament and looking down on the stars. If you were standing underneath this wheel and looking up, it would rotate anti-clockwise. I am using the clockwise representation because it is the best way to illustrate the precession of the equinox. This rotation keeps shifting one arc every 2160 years until the wheel makes a full circle of what is known as a great year. Why is this important? What we see here and what the mainstream narrative confirms is that the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn occurred during the age of Aries. For the last 2000 years or so, we have been in the age of Pisces. Remember, an age lasts for roughly 2,160 years. And we are now on the cusp of entering into the age of Aquarius. On June 2020, during the solstice, the sun entered the border of Taurus, and therefore the transition has already begun. And Google will tell you this yourself if you search. A new age, or a procession of 30 degrees into a new constellation on the March equinox, is not some new age, pseudo-spiritual fantasy of astrologists and yogis alike. It is an astronomical law of the stars above in the firmament, and you can track it yourself every equinox and solstice. 
It is a critical and integral component in the function of our realm. If we are entering the age of Aquarius, then that means that the Sun has not been in the constellation of Cancer or Capricorn during the solstice for over 2,000 years, when our realm was in the age of Aries. All the old and current cartographic maps, and even Google Earth, represent these circles of latitude as a Tropic of Cancer and Capricorn. There are no maps that present the tropic lines correctly as they should be in the age of Pisces, our current age. Wikipedia and other mainstream narratives of deception tell us that our ancient historical ancestors of horse and car and copper chisels named these circles of latitude in the times of BC, and no one in the course of history that followed bothered to change the names of the tropics to their accurate designation. We are in the age of Pisces, and have been for over 2,000 years. The circles of latitude should be called the Tropic of Gemini and the Tropic of Sagittarius. And so what? What's in a name? But this brilliant lady who taught me this flat fact was patient. What's in a name? Everything. And until she said it, I didn't realize how stupid I'd been to overlook this. Maps are not just pretty projections of the landmass on Earth. They are practical instruments of navigation. Our ancient historical ancestors, we are told, depended on celestial navigation, on the position of the stars in the firmament above to guide their way when at sea, follow the North Star. And if perchance their compasses failed, then knowing the map of the stars above would be critical. Believing that our ancestors just continued to use the designation of Cancer and Capricorn for the tropics that was established by their own historical ancestors, who belong to a different age entirely, is absurd. Celestial navigation would have been an essential skill set for anyone navigating their way across the oceans. And if they did have advanced technology, like we have our computers and GPS systems, then would they really be that lazy and neglectful to not bother designating the tropic circles to their correct constellation titles? Did they really invest so much time building the most advanced astronomical clocks only to neglect their maps? No, they did not. All these historical maps present designations for the tropic circles of latitude that are well over 2,000 years old. Why? And why are we still using this designation today? For you see, these maps, and all our maps, including Google Earth, are tools of deception. Where are the maps from the age of Pisces, the maps of the last 2,000 years? And could these maps actually be over 2,000 years old? It seems like someone does not want us to know the age we reside in, or wants to distract us from finding out just how important the precession of the equinox really is. This brilliant lady's flat fact leaves us with the following conclusions. The maps, all of them, Mercator and so on, are either 1. Original maps that belong to a period that occurred thousands of years ago and have been given false dates and narratives surrounding their creation. 2. Manipulated copies and versions of original maps that were created over 2,160 years ago. Or 3. They are all fake and created during the Great Reset of the last few hundred years to generate a false history and timeline and solidify the false historical narrative and the rise of Galilean heliocentricity. Out of all of these options, the second and the third are most likely. Cartographic world maps are not easy documents to create and establish. They require a solid understanding of our Earth's size and shape. They require a thorough understanding of the circles of latitude that are integral to the workings of our world. They require a complex understanding of the continents and land masses. These maps are likely manipulated duplications of maps thousands of years old or completely fake. And we do see signs of manipulation, especially in regard to the landmass known as Hyperborea. We see Hyperborea in various maps of varying styles, and we are told that these are from the 16th century. But towards the 17th century, we see Hyperborea start to be erased from the maps. We see unknown land masses that are present in some of these old maps vanish entirely. And then it dawned on me. 
The message of this flat fact. We have no trustworthy maps. Not a single one. We have no reliable source to show us the bigger picture of the realm we inhabit. I continued my journey, and as I ventured deeper into the forest, the path to the center that led me thus far was gone, and I could not turn back, and there lay no path in front of me. I became truly lost. How to know where you are going if you don't know where you are in the first place, if you don't have a map? All historical waymarks that I had invested some degree of trust in before were now completely unreliable and questionable. How much had been edited by the controllers? How much truth was left? What if all the maps were fake? Why are they hiding the maps of the last 2,000 years? We do not have one single accurate or honest world map. And like in all moments of being lost, right before despair takes hold, an unforeseen circumstance arose that set me back on course. I stumbled through thick overgrowth and out into a moonlit clearing with a small lake. At this clearing, I met a mysterious figure named Sturgios. I told him I was lost and he told me to come and look into the lake. He told me to watch the water. What did I see? He asked. Myself, I replied, my reflection rippling and glistening in the moonlight. Mirror, mirror. Look beyond yourself, he said. What do you see? And there it was, just as it had always been. Mirror, mirror, way up high. Mirror, mirror, in the sky. Mirror, mirror, oh how they lie.
It cannot be. All this time, hiding in plain sight. A distorted, unreliable yet steadfast reflection. A quasi-photographic image of both our known world and what is this? This is the unknown world. Thank you, Sturgios, for all your work. Sturgios has mapped out each continent to the minutest detail. His work is meticulous. He has mapped time zones, seasons, flight paths and distances. The first true flat earth map. And it is of utmost importance, primarily due to the unknown landmass over here, that Sturgios has named Terra Vista, after the Aberno Monte landmass of the same name. Why have we never heard of this land before? If the area here is our known world, then the realm is absolutely enormous. But wait a minute, Sturgis' presentation of our known world here maps the five prominent circles of latitude. We see the Arctic Circle, the Tropics, the Equator, and the Antarctic Circle. And Sturgis has mapped the Sun's concentric journey around these circles of latitude, mapping seasons and time zones with the utmost precision and accuracy. So what's going on? The Sun and Moon cannot journey the entirety of the land masses presented here because it would take too long. Does this landmass not have its own sun? Or perhaps the moon is not a map of the greater realm after all. But not so fast. We need to spend some time breaking down Sturgios' discovery here. How the image on the face of the moon was and is formed, when it was formed and why are all questions that no one can answer. Nobody knows apart from the deceivers in higher places. But there are a lot of things hidden in plain sight that bring us a little closer to having a better understanding of this mysterious phenomenon. First of all is the nature of this image. It is a composite image. You are witnessing multiple images simultaneously when looking at the face of the moon. And these images are akin to a type of X-ray photography. There is also evidently a lot of distortion and optical illusion present in these images. No one can offer an explanation as to how this composite image has formed, nor has anyone ever provided a satisfactory answer as to what exactly the moon is. And rightly so, for if they could, we would not be in this mess in the first place. While most alternative views of the moon's true nature are rooted in nonsensical theories, such as those dreamt up by many deceivers and boys who never grew up, and who like the idea that aliens created the moon and there exist underground bases deep within its craters. There is one man, however, who spoke of the moon in the years leading up to the space race in the 60s and who offered a very sensible insight. In 1965, Professor R. Foster challenged the corrupt scientific complex by stating that landing on the moon was an impossibility. It is an impossibility, according to Foster, because the moon is plasma and not solid. Here is what he said in an interview. Um, what is your theory? Well, uh, it is by now rather more than a theory. Uh, 10 or 11 years ago, I stated to various scientists that the moon is not a piece of rock, but it is a plasma, a plasma phenomenon, a cosmic plasma. Uh, and that this fact will eventually be confirmed. I made certain predictions which were already confirmed in 1958, and the situation now is coming close to a complete confirmation. Scientific views expressed all over the world now that uh, the moon seems to be of a quite different nature from what was assumed. But the, the Americans and Russians are thinking of landing men on it. Uh, well, that will never happen. Not on the moon. On Mars, on Venus, and other planets, yes. But the moon is definitely, as I assert, a plasma. Like most that speak out, Foster was most likely controlled opposition. Notice that he says it is possible to land on other planets, but not the moon. It is likely that it was his task to introduce a half-truth that the moon is a plasma phenomenon only for his claims to be, quote, debunked and proved wrong, unquote, a few years later, after they staged the moon landings. Since Foster's claim, however, our own access to technology in recent years has allowed us to investigate the moon in more detail. And through this, we see over and over again, varying instances of the moon behaving in a way that debunks a lie that it is a ball of rock. We see with our own eyes a semi-transparent moon, either at night or while there is still daylight. We see the sky through the moon, Sometimes it is even possible to see stars directly through the moon. 
Many have repeatedly demonstrated that moonlight is colder than the shade at night, and therefore it cannot be reflected sunlight as it possesses no residual warmth. We also know that spherical objects do not reflect light. By the laws of reflection, the light concentrates into a highlight point and does not reflect. You can also see frequent crescent moons when both the moon and the sun are within close proximity of each other, meaning that it is impossible for the sun to be cast in the Earth's shadow onto the moon. So if the moon is a plasma phenomenon, then how could this be formed in the first place? It is in the appropriation and demonization of the symbol of the swastika that we find some very interesting insights. The existence of a vast amount of historical literature and symbolism suggestive of a vortex opening in the center of our world is too prevalent to be coincidental. We have looked at much of this before, but strangely enough, in the years preceding and during the complete demonization and eradication of the swastika's association with the vortex, we find some additional information regarding this central vortex that is astonishing. In addition to the appropriation of the swastika as their emblem, the Nazis were also obsessed with a very similar symbol, that of the Black Sun. Prior to the rise of the Nazi regime, there existed an occult secret society within Germany called the Soul Society, sometimes alternatively pronounced Thule, that had sub-factions within it. One of these sub-societies, we are told, was the Black Sun Society. Influenced by the Rosicrucians and other hermetic groups, the Thule Society placed special emphasis on the superiority of an alleged Aryan race with innate mystical powers. The Thule Society derived its name from a mythical northern country in Greek legend. Thule was supposedly a land located furthest north. Others have called it Hyperborea. The Thule Society believed, we are told, that an elder race, the Aryans, colonized our Earth and they were located within the center of our hollow Earth. Admiral Byrd, the military Antarctic explorer, also made reference to a hollow Earth with an entrance at the North Pole. The Thule Society also believed that the Black Sun was a big ball of primer materia that existed in the center of the Earth and emanated radiation in the form of real energy. This energy has many names. Some have called it Chi, Astral Light, Odic Forces, or Orgone. In 1933, the main architect of the event known as the Holocaust, Henrik Himmler, acquired Wavelsberg Castle, a wonderful piece of old world infrastructure and technology. He supposedly remodeled the castle and in doing so imprinted the symbol of the Black Sun into the marble floor of what came to be known as the General's Hall. Much of what has surfaced regarding the German secret societies before and during the Nazi regime is deliberate misinformation, carefully controlled with the sole intention of distraction and demonization. The misinformation regarding these societies has served to further fuel the UFO and alien agenda, which many, such as Jordan Safer, David Wilcock and Corey Good, have since latched onto and promoted. They are part of a controlled opposition agenda. They are liars. The sole intention of disclosing information regarding German secret societies was to yoke together a ridiculous concept of a superior alien Aryan race existing within our world's northern core, or opening at the center, with maniacal dictatorship that resulted in gruesome genocide, or in other words, to make them seem crazier than they already were. The controllers of our realm had to appropriate the swastika and eradicate its symbolic association with the Earth's central electromagnetic and physical vortex. And while I do not think there exists a black sun underneath us, if the notion of this seems absurd and far-fetched, just remember that the majority of the world's population have already accepted that there is some kind of dark sphere beneath them, acting as a source of our world's electromagnetic energy. Heliocentrism has convinced so many that inside their little blue ball hoax, there exists a spherical core of solid iron at a temperature of over 5,000 degrees. Their own black sun. Interestingly, they never represent this iron core with the metal's usual black or dark grey colour associations in their illustrations, despite telling us it is a crystalline sphere of solid iron. Surrounding the iron solid core is an outer layer of molten iron, and it is because of this hot liquid iron, we are told, 
that the Earth has a magnetic toroidal field. And millions have accepted this and these silly diagrams that resemble Satsumas, despite the hard fact that the furthest depth a human has ever drilled into the Earth is a mere 8 miles. The heliocentric model has to acknowledge an inner core energy source because it is in fact a reality and our world cannot exist without it. It is likely that the notion of a black sun beneath us is more distraction, although it is not as absurd as the heliocentric Satsuma model. We will return to this later. What is important now, however, is that not only have we another instance of the concept of a black core at the center of our realm and another reference to a central vortex and opening, but we also have reference to energy, or what the Thule Society called Vril, radiating out of this opening. And if this is truly the case, then we have a theoretical model in which both the formation of the sun and moon makes complete sense. What I am going to try and convey now is complex, and I will do my best, but I need you first of all to forget every model of our Earth you have become familiar with. Things may not make sense at first, but by the end it will. Let's start with the realm and the firmament, and then a central opening. And now let's incorporate our known world, as outlined on the moon by Sturgios. And finally, let's add the source or electromagnetic coil beneath. Whether a magnetic rock or an electromagnetic coil, the source of our world's magnetic field is located at the center and beneath, and any source of intense electromagnetism would produce strong radiation. No one can say indefinitely, but it is highly likely that the concentrated plasma that we call the moon is a result of a unique form of radiation, similar to X-rays, that emanate from this source via an opening or vortex. X-rays or very strong radiation beams would, by the laws of physics, emanate from this central vortex in diverging straight lines. Like X-rays, they would also be invisible. The divergent beams would continue up until coming into contact with the firmament itself. X-ray beams differ from light beams and do not tend to reflect. X-rays are like a super powerful form of light, and because their wavelengths are shorter than ordinary light's wavelengths, it means their frequency is much higher. Because of this, X-rays can travel through objects that ordinary light cannot, and it means that X-rays are not reflected easily. There are not many materials that reflect, scatter, refract, or redirect X-rays. And while I'm not strictly saying that X-rays are the cause, any form of strong radiation beams would behave similarly. There do exist some materials that can reflect high energy rays, and it was a man named Lawrence Bragg in 1913 that discovered that crystalline structures reflect X-rays. That's right, crystalline structures, a crystalline firmament. Bragg reflection is used, for example, to focus monochromatic light, and there is a device called a monochromator that uses curved crystal mirrors to reflect X-rays to focus monochromatic light. Standard monochromators use a prism to break down the light. This is a very familiar image, and Wikipedia displays it for everyone to see. It is now associated with an infamous music album. What is the title of that album? Huh, <laughs> they are telling us. This means we're right on track. Radiation beams reflected off of the crystal firmament would likely be redirected down, off-center, and into the ionosphere above our heads. The same ionosphere in which the ethereal electromagnetic energy was harvested from. It is here that the beams will converge and concentrate and generate the plasma phenomenon we call the moon. The idea of electromagnetic rays reflecting from the firmament and converging in the ionosphere may seem preposterous, but there are many homemade experiments you can conduct yourself to prove the power of concentrating light rays. As seen here, the rays of the sun reflected in the concave mirror are able to produce intense heat and start a fire. The reflected light rays focus into a point to generate energy. And remember, radiation beams akin to X-rays are much more powerful than light rays. If the moon is a point of focused, condensed plasma then it has to occur within one of the layers in the ionosphere above us. All the various inert noble gases in our ionosphere appear at differing layers and altitudes. 
we looked at how these are charged by the sun's electromagnetism to form the plasma sky. At a certain altitude in the ionosphere, there are two layers of neon and helium gas. It is likely that the sun forms in a similar fashion within these layers. After all, helium is linguistically very similar to Helios. It is likely, however, that the moon is formed at the level of altitude in which the gas Krypton is present. Krypton is known for its phosphorescent white light. It is also used to create non-thermal or cold plasma, as demonstrated by contemporary scientists developing this field today. The primary reason that the moon's light is cold and not hot like the sun's is not known, but it is likely due to a polarity produced by their interaction with our electromagnetic field in the ionosphere, the moon being the dielectric negative polarity to the sun's positive charge. The craters seen on the moon are likely from the generation of this plasma. Perhaps it is some kind of plasma emulsion that displays a kind of outgassing or bubbling, much like we see with urethane paint defects. Recently, bizarre theories have emerged that we live within one of these craters on the moon. This is not correct. The moon is some kind of phosphorescent, concentrated plasma and not a solid object. You can see the formation of this plasma and its craters right here. It is not solid, it is a light. And this is great because we have a very realistic and working model as to how the moon is formed. What we don't have, however, is an explanation as to how the composite image on its face is formed. As I said before, the image we are seeing on the moon is akin to a composite X-ray photograph of our greater realm. And it is not an active reflection, but rather a historical moment captured in time. And of course, no one knows how it is formed other than those in high places. The moon is a paradoxical phenomenon, at once a volatile luminary of plasma that waxes and wanes in its luminosity and also a steadfast image captured at some point in time that does not seem to change. We only ever see this image on the moon and it never changes. This strange and mysterious image that has puzzled and inspired millions could be a result of a natural, organic phenomenon or perhaps even artificial. Again, only the controllers know. The word photo originates from the Greek photos. It means light. Hence we have words such as photosynthesis, which means the synthesis of light in which plants harvest light energy and convert it into chemical energy. A photon is the quantum of the electromagnetic field, including electromagnetic radiation, such as light. A huge misconception is the notion that photographic imaging is not a natural, organic phenomenon. This is not correct. The word photograph means light drawing. The concept of natural light sensitive material is well understood. Our bodies begin to darken when exposed to too much sunlight. Depending on the exposure to the UV, our bodies can develop tan lines. The light literally draws on us. Certain textures and textiles can fade or come to the surface when exposed to light. And there exists natural camera obscurers. A natural camera obscurer occurs when a darkened space with a hole permits light rays to enter from outside the space, resulting in a projected image of the space outside, inside the darkened area. We can even see projected images of a solar eclipse here on the ground underneath a leaf canopy due to the holes in the leaves. Natural camera obscura was, of course, the inspiration for the early development of photographic technology. Interestingly, the noble gas Krypton the same gas present in our ionosphere has been used for years, we are told, as an integral component in camera flashes for high-speed photography. It is also an essential component in hyperpolarized MRI scanners. There is also a possibility that the face of the moon is not a natural phenomenon, but was a result of an experiment. Photographic and X-ray films are created for a fusion of a gelatin emulsion with microscopic silver crystals. Because of this, exposure to light is able to capture an invisible latent image. During light exposure, the silver halide crystals grow to visible sizes, and this is what is called printing out the image. Microscopic silver was essential in producing traditional photographic images. Without it, the technology would not have been possible in the first place. 
Interestingly, in their alignment of noble metals with astronomical bodies, the alchemists designated the moon as having rulership over the metal silver. The birth of modern photography began in 1800, we are told, when the uncle of Charles Darwin tried to capture the image produced in a camera obscura. He discovered that by coating white leather with silver nitrate, he was able to partially capture real-life images. The use of silver nitrate was developed further by Louis Daguerre, who went on to birth the daguerreotype and modern photography. But what is interesting is that silver nitrate goes by another name. They called it lunar caustic, in homage to the alchemists association between the moon and silver. It's also quite interesting that many Masonic representations of the alchemists depict the sun and moon as reflected rays. And what are the coincidences that the alchemists, who probably didn't exist in the manner we are told they did, associated the moon with the very metal in which traditional photography is impossible without? This is not a coincidence. Those of the old world knew what the moon was, and perhaps an older civilization that came before them and that were also technologically advanced, had a hand in rendering the image on the moon. It's not that much of a preposterous notion, considering that we are continually experimenting with things on a cosmological scale today, staging fake rocket launches that sometimes get caught on the firmament, developing artificial suns, and some demons in higher places are even trying to find ways to dim the sun. Humans have always overstretched their ambitions when it comes to the luminaries, and I don't see why advanced civilizations of the past would have been any different. But how this composite image phenomenon came to be is not important for our journey. It's what it shows us that is important. And perhaps it is best to leave the moon shrouded in mystery. Whether a natural or artificial X-ray photographic image, what is important is its composite nature. The image we witness here is a combination of at least two fixed images that are superimposed upon one another. The first image we are seeing, as Sturgios's groundbreaking work has shown over and over again, is a skeletal outline of our realm's land masses, akin to an X-ray, and in a way we have never seen before. In this image, we see all the continents of land we associate with Earth, or what is more appropriately termed the known world, represented by the dark areas in the image. And we also see vast bodies of land and continents that we are completely unfamiliar with. Sturgeus revealed that if you treat the moon as the mirror image it is, and flip its image like you would with any reflection, then you can start to map our known land masses with utmost precision. And this is exactly what Sturgeus has done. Mapping the known world captured in the moon down to its great lakes and deserts. The striking similarities between our known world land mass and that captured on the moon are far too exact for it to be any kind of coincidence. It has been right in front of our faces every single day, literally. It is likely that no one has connected the dots here before because of this particular unknown landmass, which Sturgios has appropriately named Lumeria. And this landmass is very important because we know that it does not exist anymore. Theories of Lumeria's existence as a lost continent have been around since the 19th century with most plotting its location somewhere around the Indian Ocean. Those in the 19th century also spoke of another lost continent called Mu. They are one and the same thing. Old maps of Mu plot the land exactly where it is on the moon. And in 2007, Masaki Kimura discovered huge structures, including pyramids, castles, and roads on the ocean floor, some way from Japan a location very similar to where Lemuria is plotted here on the moon. The continent sunk years and years ago, and this is very useful because it means that this image is not an active reflection, but a moment captured in time before the continent sunk. The second image we are simultaneously witnessing in our moon is that of the firmament itself. Yes, you heard me right. The moon is the only known official image of our firmament, the face of the moon is a composite image, and we have to separate the images to fully understand what we are seeing. We have the landmass of the greater realm, and this is one image from one angle. And then we have another image from a different angle. I can only illustrate this by showing you. 
This specific area of the moon is primarily what gives the phenomenon its spherical 3D appearance. The heliocentric liars love this area of the moon, and they have used it as a weapon of deceit against us. It is not a crater with rays, like they tell us. Look closer. Really look. This is not the markings of a spherical object. It is the apex of the domed firmament from within the dome. Watch closely. This is a composite image on the moon, presenting both images simultaneously. And this is an interior of a hemisphere dome. And now... You see, if you align the central apex point of an interior hemisphere dome, then it becomes quite obvious. If you erase the remaining vector lines of the dome, then it becomes really obvious. And once you see it, it becomes very hard to unsee. It isn't a sphere. That is an optical illusion. It is the markings of a hemisphere dome. And not only is this the interior apex crown of the firmament, it is also a reflection of the center of our realm below. This area of the moon lends its spherical shape because of the so-called rays that emanate from it. But as you can see, it is an optical illusion. The rays are actually hemispherical ribs stemming from the dome's crown. This area in the middle of these ribs is not a crater. That is the vortex directly beneath the highest point of the dome. The controllers have named this area Tycho. It was given this name, we are told, by Jesuit astronomer Giovanni Riccioli in 1651. If it was not for Tycho, then the controllers of our realm would have a very hard time convincing millions that they lived on a giant spinning ball. And like with everything else, they have used Tycho to hide things in plain sight. For instance, another 17th century Masonic astronomer named Pierre Gassendi called it Umbilicus Lunaris, the navel of the moon, which is interesting as North mythology uses the same simile of the navel to describe Virgilmir, the whirlpool in the center of our realm. Arthur C. Clarke's Space Odyssey, one of the most famous science fiction novels of all time, features a crater on the moon named Tycho. In the novel, scientists find that there is a strong magnetic field emanating from the crater and discover that it is coming from a black cube monolith buried 15 meters within the crater. A black monolith, a rupus nigra, a magnetic black rock. If you separate the two images, then you can see clearly how they are in fact two images of two different angles that somehow have ended up superimposed on each other. We do not see any oceans or water mass captured in the first image, which suggests there is some kind of X-ray radiation at play. We don't see the vortex at the center in the first image for this reason. And again, no one knows how these images were formed. But if some kind of radiation beams were responsible, then the first image, the land masses of our greater realm, were most likely captured as the rays hit the firmament. And as those rays were reflected into our ionosphere and began forming the plasma mass we call the moon, it is likely that the second image was captured. And that is the image of the firmament, of the structure existing above us. And that's why we can see the outline of this structure, the stars beyond this structure, and the reflection of the vortex and other great deeps below. The moon is a masterpiece of distorted perspective, a plasma embodiment of as above, so below. And it's going to take a lot of work and careful consideration in smoothing out this distortion to try and get somewhere close enough to create a proper map of the world we live in. And because the moon is a disc-like mass of plasma, the first image of the land presents some curvilinear distortion. And you can see it here at the edges as the land begins to warp and wrap slightly. A lot of serious work needs to go into creating a flat projection of this distortion. But it shouldn't be too difficult because the distortion is only slight around these edges. And that's why Sturgios can map the circles of latitude seasons and time zones very accurately. A map without a distortion may look something like this. But important questions remain. If the central vortex is absent from the land image on the moon, then why has Sturgios plotted the land we assume is Hyperborea over here, which is not in the center? And what about all this other land? The sun and moon cannot journey above all of this land, as it would take more than 24 hours to circle all of this and we know the paths of the sun and moon. And the big one. The one you've been desperate to ask about since uncovering the only map we have. 
Where is the ice wall that you flat earthers constantly bang on about? Let's start with Hyperborea. And here's where many flat earthers may experience cognitive dissonance. Although Sturdios has plotted Hyperborea here, there is no proof that this is the true Hyperborea. There are a lot of different land masses in this region, and we cannot be sure. It pains me to say that Hyperborea may not exist in the way we have come to believe. Mercator's Hyperborea is likely the work of the Masons to throw us off the real path. And this is what our purpose is all about, isn't it? Digging for the truth is difficult business, and as we dig deeper, we come to realize that artifacts we found before may not be as useful or important as we first thought. We all get it wrong, but stay with me, no need to despair just yet. It is very interesting that the Aberno Monty map was added to the Stanford University map collection and made available to the public in 2017, the same year the Flat Earth was gaining huge traction and people were starting to wake up. It's also interesting that it has been arranged as a planisphere. The huge individual sheets of this map were originally arranged as an atlas projection, but David Ramsey purchased the map in 2016 and the team got to work scanning each sheet individually and processing them digitally to wrap around a sphere. Perhaps the release of Monty's marvelous map was an attempt to keep flat earthers thinking Hyperborea was located at the North Pole and to perhaps bring back any that were sitting on the fence and hadn't truly woken up yet. A very subtle act of manipulation. But why would they want the flat earth community to keep fixed on Hyperborea? I have some thoughts regarding Hyperborea, but first we must turn to the clocks. Those of the old world knew. They knew exactly the type of earth they lived upon, and it's displayed for everyone to see right here in the astronomical clocks. The zodiac dial here, or what is officially known as the ecliptic dial on the Prague astronomical clock, allegedly constructed in the 15th century, does not divide its 30 degree constellation arcs equally. It is also off center, from the map behind and appears distorted. And so many clocks of the old world present very similar ecliptic dials. But let's look a little closer at this magnificent Prague clock. As you can see, the zodiac dial contains a border that presents a series of vertical lines. These lines represent a chunk of five days and each zodiac section represents a month. Those of the old world use this dial to track the seasons the phases of the moon, and to present the day. But in a realm of perfect circles, why are six of the 30 degree arcs here represented within a smaller space than the other six? They all contain five subsections, so why are they different? As you can see here, the Prague astronomical clock presents the land of Earth in the middle. Why does the ecliptic dial need to be bigger and off-center with the representation of Earth? The official liars of our realm the satanic controllers have an answer, of course. They tell us it is because the ecliptic dial is a stereographic projection. Stereographic projection is a mapping function that projects a sphere onto a plane. All maps are stereographic projections. We have no accurate maps. Wikipedia tells us that the ecliptic plane is projected onto the face of the clock, and because of the Earth's tilted angle of rotation relative to its orbital plane, it is displaced from the center and appears to be distorted. The projection point for the stereographic projection is the North Pole. In their fabricated heliocentric model, the Earth has an axial tilt of 23.4 degrees. The controllers needed to invent the axial tilt to justify the entire spherical lie, to justify the seasons, the vastly differing climates, and to justify the absolute fixed position of Polaris over the true geographic north. The reason Polaris does not appear to move, they say, is because Polaris lies nearly in direct line with the Earth's rotational axis above the North Pole, the North Celestial Pole. Polaris stands almost motionless in the sky, and all the stars of the northern sky appear to rotate around it. Remember, everything in their model is moving at incomprehensible speeds but we can see with our own eyes that Polaris remains fixed. If they did not invent the axial tilt, or what is known as the obliquity of the ecliptic, then they would have no way to justify this in their fairyland model of orbiting planets. Polaris does not move, it remains fixed. If you are in Iceland or America, 
you can film a star trail of Polaris, and it remains fixed. But it is not fixed directly overhead in these locations. The only place we are told to observe Polaris directly overhead at a 90 degree angle is the true geographic North Pole. You know, that place where no one ventures. And that's why they invented the tilt. They tell us that Earth's true geographic North Pole is tilting directly at Polaris. And as the Earth spins on its little axis, Polaris appears to remain fixed. They tell us that the star's steadfast nature is an optical illusion. But their lights fall apart swiftly when you consider that the entire constellation system of the stars above remain constant. We always see the same stars and constellations. If Earth was spinning on its axes while orbiting the Sun and the Sun was zooming through our galaxy, which is also moving in a bigger universe, would the precession of the equinox really be that predictable? Would the constellations of the tropic circles of latitude really appear with such consistency in union year after year at the solstice, or would it appear a bit more random? They are liars, and we all know that water does not lie. Resting water does not curve or convex. For you see, the satanic controllers are masterminds of reverse engineering. The celestial zodiac ecliptic dial is not a stereographic projection. The entire heliocentric model is reverse engineered science, and they had to start at Polares and trace their steps back to ensure they justified its fixed, immovable position and made sure it was compatible with their globe. The Prague astronomical clock has been altered drastically over the last 200 years. It suffered fires, been restored and altered. And you can see that here in the way the projection of the Earth behind the clock has changed over time from a flat map to a bulging, unsightly sphere. But look, when you align the ecliptic dial with the map of our greater realm, then this all starts to make sense. The zodiac constellations appear distorted, despite all having five equal subsections, because our location is limited within a portion of the greater realm, and this governs our observational perspective of the stars. The shape of this dial has nothing to do with an axial tilt. It is designed this way to reflect our known world within this magnetic field pocket. The realm is much larger, and therefore the firmament and circumference of the fixed stars in the water beyond is much larger than the circumference of our own magnetic field. Polaris is here, above the center, and this is so important. They tell us that our magnetic north pole is separate from what they call true geographic north. Our magnetic north pole is moving. How can that be? Is that just another one of their lies? No, it is not. It is a half-truth. They tell us over the course of a century, the magnetic North Pole has moved from its location, just above Canada, to near Greenland, and is now en route to Siberia. It is moving fast. Why? The symbol of the swastika and the black sun offer some clues as to why. For years now, flat earthers have come to see the magnetic North Pole and geographic North Pole as synonymous. But they are not. As you know, the swastika symbolizes the vortex, but the black sun takes its symbolic message further. The central core circle here represents the iron core, the black sun, or what the fictional Mercator called the Rupes Nigra. But look closer. There is another ring outside of the central core. Remember, the black sun is the energetic core inside of the vortex. And remember also that in the heliocentric model, they acknowledge that the Earth's core is a solid iron sphere, but there also exists an outer core of molten iron liquid. They also tell us that this liquid outer core is responsible for producing our moving magnetic field and poles. This is why the pole is moving, because the magnetic field is not emanating from the solid core, but from a volatile outer core. This is what the second circle here represents. And like everything heliocentric related, all you need to do is apply common sense and flatten the curve and things start to make sense. There is not a spherical outer core, but some kind of electromagnetic coil, perhaps even made of molten iron, surrounding the central solid core. At the core we have a vortex opening, but the actual volatile energetic source is beneath. The central core is akin to a central clock dial. It's solid and remains fixed and everything else moves around it. 
but it is also the keystone responsible for this entire movement. Everything surrounding our world moves. The stars above move, the sun and the moon, and the electromagnetic outer core under us, and all the while the land itself and central solid core remain stationary. And not only does this outer core move and take our magnetic north pole with it, but it is highly likely that it moves in accordance with the precession of the equinox, in time with the stars above as they move from their fixed positions, which means that it probably moves 30 degrees of the realm circumference every 2160 years. The north magnetic pole is slowly moving, and it is as natural as the sun and moon's concentric journey above us. And this is why the symbol of the black sun is a 12 spoked wheel. Each spoke represents a fixed constellation of the zodiac. Each section is an individual age. And the result is a situation like this. Every 2160 years, our north magnetic pole circles the inner solid core and vortex by 30 degrees. This is why the pole has moved from Canada and is en route to Siberia. It is traversing the outer central circle, or what is more appropriately termed the magnetic circle. We live inside of a perfect clock, inside of God's clock. The sun and moon circle our magnetic north pole, which is situated roughly at the center of our known world's landmass. But this magnetic north pole circles the inner vortex and completes a full revolution every 25,920 years or what is referred to as a great year. Each great year consists of 12 precessional or astronomical ages of 2,160 years each. We are on the cusp of entering the age of Aquarius, and this is why our magnetic north pole is en route to Siberia. As the north magnetic pole circumvents the central magnetic circle, the toroidal magnetic field moves with it. The sun and moon are bound in their revolution by our magnetic north pole. And because of this, they move within our magnetic toroidal field only. This is why the magnetic north pole will always be the center of our known world. As I said before, the first image of the landmass presented in the moon's face is likely akin to an X-ray image and has not captured any water mass. And because of this, it has only recorded the areas of our realm with high density, such as the land, in the same way an x-ray image will capture the parts of our bodies with the highest density, like the bone, but not the blood in our veins. In a sense, it is appropriate to view the landmass captured here as skeletal, and because of this, it has not captured the water or ocean surrounding our land, nor does it display a differentiation between the frozen landmass and that which is not frozen. If the sun's concentric journey above us is bound by the north magnetic pole here and its magnetic toroidal field and this entire magnetic field is moving with the pole then it is likely we have a situation of a changing climate as this process unfolds. All areas outside of our magnetic field will inevitably be frozen and dark due to the lack of sunlight and this is consistent with what some of the scriptures have told us. I saw the great rivers and I came to the great river and to the great darkness, and went to the place where no flesh walks. I saw the mountains of the darkness of winter. This is your ice wall, and it's not a constant, fixed wall. It is continually melting and refreezing with the revolution of the pole over the course of a great year and each astronomical age. Do you now understand why they are terrified of the ice melting, of our Earth supposedly heating up? and why this demonic joke of a man wants to dim the sun. They are using natural climate change due to the rotation of the magnetic pole to justify a whole host of useless measures and money laundering. They are terrified because they are on the verge of losing all control of the narrative. We must save the precious Antarctica from melting, the last unspoiled place on Earth. But as you can see, there is no landmass for us to call Antarctica. It is a complete lie. When they refer to Antarctica, there is only the Antarctic Circle, and a lot of the footage at the so-called Antarctica could have been taken at any location around this circle. As you can also see, the landmasses of South America, New Zealand, and Australia 
all fall within close proximity to the outer edge of the greater world map and would therefore be within close proximity to the foundations of the firmament itself. This is most likely the reason there is heavy military presence in these regions. The change in climate, the melting of the Antarctic Circle, is as natural as day and night. It is a macro process of the larger clock we live within. We have already discussed how the constellations that the sun is in during the equinox and solstice form a cross on the zodiac wheel when signaling the age and tropic designation. We'll look closer at the Prague clock again. The central dial of the clock is placed within the center of our magnetic field, and the sun and moon move within this field. Our magnetic field is off center from the overall greater realm. It isn't an even cross, but a true cross, or what is now referred to as a Latin cross or crucifix. We live within the cross beam of the cross. And in case you hadn't noticed, our magnetic field pocket within the greater realm also forms a crescent moon. Not the type of crescent moon associated with the alchemical mercury and silver, but this kind of crescent moon. The same symbol that the controllers appropriated and redesignated to represent nobility. The cross and crescent are natural expressions inherent in the workings of the timepiece we live within. They are natural expressions of God's clock. And we got it wrong. Polaris is not situated 90 degrees above our North Magnetic Pole, in the region we call the Arctic, home to Greenland and Iceland. Polaris rests above the vortex at the center of the greater realm. And this is where the distinction between geographic cardinal directions and magnetic directions needs to be emphasized. When we travel across our known world, or the land within our toroid or magnetic field, we use a magnetic compass, and the magnetic pole is in the center. That's why when we travel from west to east, we go in a circle, and when we travel north, we go towards the center, and when traveling south, we move directly away from the center. However, there also exist geographic cardinal points. And what do the scriptures have to say about this? It's right there in Enoch's reference to the four quarters of the world. Our magnetic field, according to Enoch, lies in the geographic north of the greater realm. And the first quarter is called the east, because it is the first. And the second, the south, because the most high will descend there. And the west quarter is named the diminished. And the fourth quarter, named the north, is divided into three parts. First of them is for the dwelling of men. The second contains seas of water, the abysses and forests and rivers, and darkness and clouds. And the third part, the garden of righteousness. The vortex is in the center of the realm, or what is more appropriately termed, true north. The x-ray image of the land on the moon map does not display this vortex, but, as discussed, it is present in the second image of the firmament. At the crown of the firmament, we see it reflected, the navel of the world. It could be that the Garden of Righteousness that Enoch refers to, and what is also known as Hyperborea, is located right where Sturgios has plotted it. But this land is not the true north or central vortex. That can only exist in the center. And as stated before, there is some curvilinear distortion present in the composite image on the moon's face. I have used my little colorful map here strictly for illustrative purposes. I am not a map maker, but I did attempt to smooth some of this distortion out. Let's hope Sturgios tackles the distortion. And in both my quick attempt and the actual moon map, we do see a body of land right in the center, right here. Perhaps this is the Garden of Righteousness, surrounding the central vortex. And perhaps Enoch's reference to it being located in our northern quarter is because it can only be accessed from within this quarter. Who knows? It is likely that the controllers deliberately put Hyperborea at the Arctic in the fraudulent maps to throw anyone of a curious and adventurous nature off track. If someone set out to find True North, using these maps, they would fail. And because of the distinction between magnetic and geographic direction, finding True North would be a monumental feat, even without their deceptions. 
If anyone wanted to truly journey to the center of our greater realm, they would have a very hard time, and they would need to forsake the compass altogether. If the geographic south of our magnetic field is down here, with the lands usually associated with south, then the central vortex of the greater realm falls within our geographic north. But we would not be able to reach it with the compass pointed north. It is not located at our north magnetic pole. If you use a compass to travel north, you will end up traveling here. If the south pole is the entire Antarctic circle, then to travel to the true north, you would need to go south. But even then, this would most likely fail. If the center is made of iron, then at some point it would supersede the southern magnetic pole of our magnetic field. If by chance you were lucky to head in the direction of true north, then the compass would most likely fail altogether due to the iron core. As the mysterious text, the Inventio Fortunata states, here the ship's compass loses its property, and no vessel with iron on board is able to get away. The only way to get to true north is by celestial navigation via Polaris, a skill set that has been generally eradicated from common knowledge. And I bet these oceans are heavily guarded. We will be returning to magnetic fields later in our journey. And we really need to reappropriate the definition of the word planet. Planet, a smaller subsection or fraction of a much larger plane. Time is ticking, viewer. You are wondering why I brought you into this dark forest. Why is all of this important? Because once upon a reset, the established timeline is a lie. We cannot begin to map our revised timeline unless we start plotting it in accordance with the greater realm we inhabit. We need to apply the astronomical clock, the ages, to get closer to some kind of clarity. We are not out of the forest yet. And can you feel it yet? The entire matrix is starting to crumble. Everything we've ever learned, everything we've ever relied upon to shape our understanding of the realm we temporarily inhabit is now unreliable. And all we are left with is our own eyes. And all we see over and over again is water always seeking its flat level. We see structural remains that those in the history books could not have built. And we see a great evil multiplying. We only have our eyes and old photographs, moments captured in time, the act of photography, the art of juxtaposition, of comparison and contrast. We are so small, our world in the mirror. Where are the maps of the age of Pisces? Where has our history gone? And what has become of us now? Are we that different to those we see in the 19th century? Look at us, desperately searching for lost time. Our boots caked in mud, our entire days spent digging through the deception, digging and moving the mud, frantically digging, tired and aching, but not giving up. And what do we find? The same things that our ancestors of the 19th century found. Glimmers of glory, of beauty, of pain, and wonder that remain stubbornly silent, offering no explanation for its existence or how it came to be. Old photographs and such glory. I haven't shown you just how impossible these structures are yet. The only thing these people have ever built is the lie, brick by brick, and I need to show you how they did it. Our world in the mirror, once upon a reset. There have been many great resets during our realm's history, all very different in nature. We need to look at all of them. How to reset time, to wind back the clock, the death and dawn of a new age. This was not the first reset, nor is it the last. It is happening again right now. Empty cities, such quietness. There is a war going on back home, viewer and most haven't even realized. A peculiar and irregular type of war. Silent warfare, information warfare, biological warfare. A war as old as time itself. A war between the forces of light and those of darkness. And we're caught in the middle, on the cusp of the dawning of a new age. A war for Aquarius, 
the water bearer. Watch the water. And for us have fell in love with the truth and who have resisted the darkness. We've had the armor of God on now for so long. How many of your friends and family have deserted you? How many of them left you stuck in the mud? And you've remained steadfast. But it's time we took a stand and became very loud. It's time to draw the sword of truth. The blind are going to need us because nothing can stop what is coming. The legend of Ophorus, bearing Christ, bearing the truth so it can reach the masses. I will try my best to continue our journey, but as things become even darker, the lights will inevitably go out and our journey may end here. But you have more than you know, more than you need. You've seen enough deception. Do not believe a single thing they say. We have to try and keep moving. The clock is ticking and we don't have much time. We need to go to Siberia. There is something frozen in the ice that needs examining. Come on, it's time to address the big question. Who were the citizens of the future? And it's not what you think. The timeline is wrong and the maps are fake. This is not the answer. No. For you see, they had a king over them, and not just any king.